Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm going to call the meeting to order. Uh, if we, Ms. Goodell, if you will call the roll. Yes, uh, Mr. Ankuma. Mr. Castillo. Here. Ms. Gill. Here. Mr. Lawrence. Here. Mr. Reitinger. Here. Ms. Ward. Here. Mr. Webb. Here. If you all would join me for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, will someone move to please to adopt the agenda? All in favor? Aye. Aye. And we're on to the oath of the superintendent. So if Dr. Noonan will come on down with, uh, Mr. with our clerk of the court. Falls Church City School Board. Nearby. Arlington County. Uh, it is my honor to administer the oath to uh, Dr. Peter Noonan as your new school superintendent. So uh, Dr. Noonan, would you please raise your right hand? Do you, Dr. Peter Noonan, solemnly swear or affirm that you will uphold the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Virginia and that you will faithfully and partially discharge all the duties incumbent upon you as the superintendent for the Falls Church City School System according to the best of your ability? I will. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Uh, Paul, if you and Dr. Noonan would come up here and we'll do a, a photo with the, with the full, uh, with the board. On to public comments. In accordance with school board bylaws 2.30, the time for each speaker is limited to three minutes. Additional written statement may be submitted to the clerk for dissemination to the board, to board members, and for the record, deposition of requests. And we have one speaker tonight, and that was is Mr. Brian Rye. It's your, your name and address. Uh, good evening. My name is Brian Rye. I live at 613 11th Street with my wife, Colleen, and our son, Alex, who is in kindergarten at Mount Daniel. It sounds like you're proposing a major expansion at, at TJ based on the last meeting, and that makes sense to build as many classrooms there as you possibly can. But as you acknowledge, that creates a problem. The only place where an expansion can take place is where the trailers housing 145 students now sit, and the floodplain leaves you with no other viable place to put those trailers during the construction phase. So one suggestion I'd like to offer is simply to stagger those projects consecutively and start the TJ project once Mount Daniel is finished, which they're kind of lined up to almost do anyway, using over the 250 new student spaces at Mount Daniel to initially handle second grade during TJ's construction. By coordinating those timelines and moving second grade to Mount Daniel during TJ's project, TJ's grades three through five would be below that building's current capacity, thus eliminating the need for and the cost of those trailers at TJ. And most importantly, we believe this solution is best for our students and their teachers in grades K through five for the next few years. 
as it makes optimal initial use of the expanded Mount Daniel while allowing grades three through five to be comfortably housed, which they haven't been in a long time, you know, at the existing TJ facility during their expansion. Longer term, if you're able to sufficiently expand TJ, might then make sense to move second grade uh, back over there. But that's just one idea. As the TJ project approaches completion, the board can then reassess enrollment projections. As Phil noted uh, during the last meeting, you'd like to maximize your flexibility. And this strategy buys you time to do that while events unfold. For example, just last Friday, Secretary of State uh, Tillerson proposed eliminating 2,300 jobs at the State Department. Don't know if that'll happen. If it does, that would have a meaningful impact here. So it seems prudent to gather another year or two of data while all this construction is taking place before making any long lasting decisions. On the central office, I'm all for saving 365,000 at least expenses and it frees up parking when we need to go to the post office. That's great. Um, but respectfully, the flip side of that published uh, proposal doesn't make a lot of sense. Essentially, as I understand it, the first step in your strategy to address the lack of class space is to eliminate 75 current class spaces and say, let's take that facility that was specifically designed for pre-K students with special needs and turn it into an office for grown-ups. Any permanent central office solution seems much better suited to uh, be part of the George Mason campus instead of this, out, this uh, Thackeray proposal that essentially handcuffs your K through five flexibility. And I get there's a timing mismatch between when the central office lease ends and when the high school campus uh, hopefully uh, will be done. Uh, maybe the staff could use the TJ trailers that wouldn't be needed if uh, this pr uh, plan goes through, or maybe everyone in the year 2017 and 2018 can simply telework and hold meetings online for a year or two. Our main point, though, is whatever that solution for the central office is, we respectfully request that it take a back seat to the needs of our uh, students and their teachers in grades K through five. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Are there any other public comments? Not. We will move on to the George Mason presentation on the 2017-2018 course offering and master schedule. Mr. Chair, members of the board, community, um, I think you'll find uh, tonight a series of presentations for discussion with the board and staff. Uh, I think you'll find these to be of, of interest. Um, a couple of months ago, meeting with uh, Principal Hills, we reviewed the number of classes, courses that are offered this year who have enrollments below 10 and enrollments below 15. And um, Mr. Hills looked at the incoming or upcoming school year enrollments, class signups, master schedule. And he and our director of counseling, um, Amy Kurjanovitz, uh, met with uh, Ms. High and myself ooh, two, two weeks ago. And I wanted to bring forward to the board um, <clears throat> a brief overview that uh, our two fine staff members here have put together because I think it's important that the board knows going forward what's planned for fiscal year, uh, school year 17, 18, and what your enrollment looks like, class loading looks like, master schedule looks like, and to what extent these two people have worked so hard in order to provide the most efficient and effective ac academic program and master schedule. So with that, let me turn our attention to um, our principal and our director of guidance. Good evening. Good evening. And thank you, Dr. Schiller, and to the board for allowing us this opportunity. You know, developing a master schedule is quite the challenge, especially for a high school like George Mason that prides themselves on offering challenging opportunities for each and every one of our students. The best way for me to describe it is I equate it to a large puzzle. Um, I remember my grandfather years ago had this 5,000 piece puzzle, and every time I used to visit with him, I feel like it never was completed and he always had maybe a hundred pieces and he used to tell me Matt it's a process and this is exactly what uh, developing the master schedule equates to um, last year we really needed to take a look and decide programmatically what's going to be in the best interest of our students um, this year the same thing we are having to determine Number one, we always want to place the student's best interest first. And programmatically, we have to make some difficult decisions that may require us to take a look at many of our uh, class offerings and determine which we feel is going to be appropriate for our students. Um, we started by taking a look at the entire district's needs. 
We are a K through 12 continuum. I applaud Dr. Schiller for allowing us to recognize this. I think the transparency of the budget process established a clear cut method by which the high school would ultimately have to evaluate certain programs. We recognize the need to look through an anticipatory lens due to the fluctuating enrollment. Last summer, just to give you an example, we had 117 new students. For a school that has 817 students, you can do the math. That percentage is large, and it requires us to really think outside the box. We wanted to create and establish the master schedule this year by being as proactive as possible. To put that into perspective, let's say we had 30 new sophomores that came to us, which we did last year. That actually might require us to add an entire section of geometry. That's a point two. Where do we get that staff from? What do we do? We have to move things around. And it's quite the challenge. But what we wanted to do this year is develop and make sure that we plan for, for that. Here's a great story. About four years ago when I started, uh, we were taking a look at the numbers and we had several students that came to us from August 10th through August 29th. We recognized, oh my goodness, we're gonna need another section of English 9. So what did I do? I reached out to, to Miss High. Miss High, what can we do? We're gonna need a point two. And it was quite challenging. You know, it's, uh, unfortunately that process doesn't exist. And I'll let Ms. Kajanowicz chime in here. It's so true. I'm, I've been here for a while and, and things Sorry. And things have really changed over the years. And there are no point twos floating out there, which has changed the way we're trying to think and trying to plan for the future, knowing our enrollment is still going to go up. It was very easy. A teacher felt very comfortable coming to the principal and saying, my class is up to 36. We need another point two and we could go to the school board or the principal could go to the school board, we do realize that's not the case right now. So hence why Mr. Hills is trying to be very proactive and trying to look at all courses to see where we think the growth might be and to make sure we have everything in place so that we don't have to beg, borrow, and steal from you. That's a perfect way to put it. So clearly we can't continue to operate like that. So we shared a document with the board that outlines our projected classes under 15, as well as some of our projected classes that are over 30. Uh, we have kind of both, both ends of the spectrum. Uh, our numbers have dramatically uh, improved from those of last year. Just to put it into perspective, we had a, close to 18 classes, our core classes, that were under 15 for a variety of reasons, whether they were higher level classes, um, academic support classes. With the creation of the 2017-18, we've lowered that number to approximately eight classes that are under 15. And as I sit and I look at some of the classes, they're all for good reason. Okay? We recognize that we need to start thinking through a different lens. And I'll give you a prime example of some of the discussions that we've had with many of the leaders in our uh, departments. So we recognize that we have multiple higher level uh, science offerings. We sat down with our leaders. We said, you know what? It looks as though our IB physics program, the numbers continue to drop. And we always have to consider why that is. Uh, what we determined is that there seems to be a need for science in other areas. It happens to be the cohort of students that are driven towards our biology and chemistry programs, which we still offer those classes. Uh, so the decision we made was because we only had a certain number of offerings for our IB physics higher level class, we wanted to shift that and we decided to run our chemistry higher level class instead. Um, projecting out, taking a look at the number of students that continue on the two-year HL physics course, we normally have anywhere between 10 and 12 students and based on numbers from previous years, we recognize that half those students tend to go in a different direction and not continue with the second year. That being said, we decided to run our IB Chem SL as well as the IB Chem HL class. We uh, took a look at what several schools in the area do, and we recognize that for a school of 817, it's impossible to offer as many higher level classes as we do. We consulted with many other IB schools in the area, as well as Dan Coast, our IB coordinator, and we felt that we still give our students enough leeway and latitude to earn the IB diploma, as well as the necessary science credits for graduation. 
I just want to add, by us not offering the higher level physics next year, we will still have physics available for our students. So any of our students who want to go into engineering and really feel that they need physics, we're going to be offering regular physics, physics standard level, and physics dual enrollment. So they still have an opportunity to take physics at a standard level for their IB diploma, or if they choose not to use the, the SL level, they can still have physics to prepare for engineering in college. Also, we recognize the need for the MEHGM alignment. This is something that we, we really started a few years ago uh, with shared classes and courses. Uh, one in particular is uh, in our World Languages program. We asked the board and the city council for a 0.6. This was because we recognize the numbers continue to grow. Uh, we must look at our world language program through the 6 through 12 continuum. And doing so, you notice that some of our classes are below 15. We do anticipate growth based on the number of MEH students that will take courses uh, and higher level language courses at the high school. And I think really it comes down to thinking outside the box, recognizing that we're going to have our seventh graders enrolled in French 1 and French 2 who are taking classes at the high school. And that's happening in several of our courses. Uh, we also note that some of our VPA, Visual Performing Arts classes, uh, such as drums, an offering that we really, really enjoy having at the high school, but our numbers are low. So we ended up meeting with uh, Mr. Harris at, at the middle school um, and leaders of their VPA department and determined that it would make most sense to align that particular class, allowing for anywhere between 10 and 20 of our students to come up and actually take drums at the high school. So we are aligning the middle school and the high school, and it's allowing us to reduce the FTEs. It's allowing us to really think outside the box, which is something we need to do. I just wanted to add one thing about the language. Now that we're an MYP school, MYP division basically, all of our middle school students up through grade 10 are required by MYP to take a language, and that's the only discipline that we see a huge shift in from what we have had. So we know that our enrollment numbers in languages are going to go up. Absolutely. Thank you. We also take great pride at George Mason of ensuring that our what we call academic support classes, those are our co-taught courses, uh, courses with our students with uh, learning disabilities, uh, that they are uh, lower than, than what the average class size would traditionally be. Uh, and that's outlined in, in the document that was shared. We have several of our classes, our SPED classes, reading strategy classes, um, ESOL classes. Those are the classes that we really want to keep small. Uh, and we continue to do so. Yes, that. Okay. Also, what we shared with you were average class sizes above 30. And one of those is wind ensemble. And many of us know that wind ensemble, to have 40 or 50, is almost small. So to have a large group, that's OK. As a matter of fact, our band director hopes that we do have a large group because she has to satisfy all the parts of the band. But we do worry a little bit about our world, modern world history and our economics and personal finance class. As we know, economics and personal finance is now a required course for all students to graduate in Virginia. We offer that course in, traditionally in the classroom. We offer it through our high C program, and then we offer our IB economics course. But looking at our course selections for next year, we've decreased the number of sections of economics and personal finance, making those courses much larger, much se those sections of that course much larger. And I'm not really sure what we're going to do about that or how to address it, but as of this moment, that's where we are. And we just wanted you to be aware that that's where we are right now. We don't know if some of those students will take it through high C, through the hybrid program, or what. But right now, it's high. Modern World History is a history course that's generally taken by juniors and seniors. A lot of them when they transfer in, but even a, a large number of our students who have gone through George Mason, because they enjoy history, but they don't want to go down the IB route, and they want to continue with history. And that one we only have one section of next year, and on the sheet that I gave you, it's 31. When I checked right before I came, it was 32. So that can fluctuate moment by moment for any of our courses. But that's where we are with 
large class sizes and then championship training. What Amy speaks to is the fact that this is clearly a living, breathing document. Uh, it's going to continue to evolve throughout the summer when we take a look at our projected enrollment numbers. We don't know what they're going to look like between August 1st and August 26th. We uh, consistently are, are fielding phone calls from uh, families that are you know, all over the, the world considering coming here. And I think that's definitely a factor that goes into our planning. So that's kind of what we wanted to share with you this evening. Is there any questions that we can answer for you? Mr. Lawrence? Yeah, Matt, I just had one question when you were talking about the um, sizes for classes for ELL, special ed reading strategies. You don't have numbers in your spreadsheet. And is that because they're so small you'd get into people being identified? Yeah, th those classes uh, are basically we're now meeting with families and conducting IEPs. And those are IEP driven decisions. So a student who would be in, let's say, you know, a reading strategies class, it's something that's written in their IEP. And so we don't know what those numbers are going to look like but yes to answer your question those numbers are very very uh, small and also the numbers are derived based on standardized testing or star testing and so we are still gathering the data to determine what those class sizes are going to look like okay if we could just figure out some way to, to indicate it because right now it just looks like we don't have the numbers and I, I can get you the, the numbers case. that we currently have I'd be happy to share that well no, I'm just thinking for the public if they looked at this they would say they just missed putting something in okay. so even a notation explaining you know exactly what you just said so that it's clearly not in there for a reason it's not just a mistake right we can absolutely do that thank you mr reininger thank you uh, mr hills mr janowitz it's very informative presentation I, I had a question about one of the points you raised which was uh, the use of dual enrollment to address classes that given our small size and growing population we may not be able to fill are there are there classes because of um, the way they're done at the college level or because of the difficulty of matching the ib requirements that are harder to do dual enrollment on i'm just trying to figure out if there's a a way that you think about when, when you're setting up which classes we do internally at the high school and which we suggest through dual enrollment is there a preference towards one or the other in certain areas? I think, I think that's a great question. I think it depends on a multitude of factors. Uh, one being there are several specific requirements for a teacher who can act, who's eligible to teach a dual enrollment course, unlike there would be for a teacher who's teaching the IB course. Um, we have to consider that. We have to consider the entry level classes for students who want to basically earn a credit for their first year of college. And so when we take a look at you know, your introductory level of physics, um, that's something we, we really harp on. We want students to be exposed to what they would see in their first year of college. Uh, at times, that does mirror uh, the IB content and curriculum, uh, but it's also presented very differently. And so I think it's, it, it depends on really in terms of if we want a student to uh, be exposed to that, that first year of college, what it's going to look like. Um, and it also depends on the different offerings that NOVA allows us to, 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 to use. And I think that's also an important factor. Um, could you please clarify what you're doing with physics again? I kind of yep. missed that. And I have another qu follow-up question as well. No, no, that's totally okay. So, so what we decided to do, we took a look at our physics numbers. Um, we recognized that if we wanted to that program to grow, because we offer several physics courses, such as dual enrollment physics, as well as our traditional physics, um, we could not continue to sustain with the number of requests that we had. So let's say I think we had about uh, 12 requests for the HL1 class. We took a look at the data. The data shows us that we have anywhere between four to eight students who take HL1 physics and do not continue with, with the H2 level. It's a choice that students have. They don't need to. Um, and what that would mean is it would put the second year of physics at a total of anywhere between five and seven students. And we felt strongly that because we offer so many different higher level science courses that we needed to make a decision at that point. Um, and so we did.
you're going to have uh, basic physics and um, IB physics still? Have, yeah, uh, still st standard IB? level, standard, standard level, standard mm -hmm. dual enrollment and your traditional physics class, yes. Okay, all right. And then the other question I had is uh, regarding uh, personal finance. Is that offered in the summer to take online? Absolutely, okay. yes. Many of our students choose that option. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hills and Ms. Krujanowicz. Um, so one of the things about George Mason that makes it different from the other schools is generally you look at the average load per teacher rather than class size. So I guess one way to ask the question is why are we talking about class size? Um, but I guess the, a better way to say is irrespective of what we see here, how are the numbers looking for teacher workloads and does, if, if you are measuring by, what is it? I forgot what the number of the, uh, for the work, it's 120 per student. Um, does address, it, how do the two mesh? Because it seems a little apples and oranges. And you're right, they are. Um, and I don't have the exact figures right now because teachers have just been assigned to certain courses and that's still a little bit in flux because some are moving to teach other sections of courses based on us changing what's going to be offered and based on, I hate to say this, but based on um, having co-teachers and who it's felt would be the best general education teacher and co-teacher to do the best for the student. So teachers are still moving around a little bit. But we certainly will be able to get that course load because we have average class sizes or section sizes right now. So I would think probably within the next week or two we would pretty much have that finalized as much as possible, even though it's a living, moving document. And we could certainly give those numbers as well. Does that answer your question? Kind I don't of a have little it bit, right but, now. but one, one of the things that I'm struggling with is you know, on, on the one hand, enrollment is rising. I get that certain languages are losing popularity relative to other languages, although now it sounds like the IB language requirement will lift all those boats as well. So I, I think it's, I, I'm struggling a little bit with if we are a growing school division, why we're talking about, are we just mix, getting into a, a better mix um, of course offerings, or are we simply simplifying the mix so that we can reduce? I, I guess, for example, if, how does, if, if the problem is that personal finance is over 30, how does changing physics fix that? It wasn't correlating physics to economics and personal finance because that is apples and oranges. Because who teaches physics is not qualified to teach the other and vice versa. So right now we're looking at our science department when it comes to physics and the number of requests from our students. That's how we based that decision. It really had no bearing on the other courses outside of the discipline of science. Um, economics actually falls into many different disciplines. It falls into math, it falls into social studies. So I, I could equate that to other departments other than science. I think there is a great correlation between the numbers in this in our sections compared to our teachers overall caseload and I am aware of the 120 number um, and hopefully we'll get close to that 120 equally but it's rare that we go over that correct we are going to go over that in PE we are going to go over that in band but chances are we will not go over that in other disciplines yeah, I, I guess my, my concern here is that, for example, I understand Arabic was cut because the, the demand simply wasn't there as anticipated. I, I uh, the, the personal part of me would hope that students wouldn't have to learn physics ever again based on my experience learning physics, but I understand there are some people out there who love it and want to learn it, and I'm a little, yeah, you know, I, I have heard there's some concern about the impact of cutting certain science offerings on, on the department and the school as a whole, and I don't know what we can do to increase interest, you know, grow the, the physics interest, um, but, but it seems to me that I, I'm still struggling with the, the right sizing of offerings and class sizes here. 
That's, you don't have to answer that. No, I just, <laughs> wanted, I just wanted to share one other thing, and that is we've noticed over the years there are ebbs and flows in many of our courses. Our IB anthropology and our IP, IB psychology, one went up one year, one went down another year. So for a while back, we decided to alternate the years that we would offer those courses. Right now, we're seeing a little bit of the decline in the physics, and hence why we are where we are. Not to say that'll stay. I think just to add to that, we tend to take a look at each of our core disciplines separately. So when you talk about your personal finance, the reason those numbers look like that, one, we're, we have not yet determined uh, which of our teachers, for example, will be potentially teaching that course. Uh, you can be certified in English, you can be certified in social studies, so there's still some movement with that. When you take a look at physics and science, you have X number of FTEs. And so what we're trying to do is really just focus course or, or discipline by discipline. That's kind of the method we use. So when you talk about how does the science, how do the science numbers equate to, let's say, the personal finance, eventually they will once you start with the disciplines and move on to, uh, to other areas. And we would consider our personal finance economics to be more of an elective course, which gives us a little bit more latitude in what we're able to do. Also because we offer it in high C and our physics class is not offered through our high C program. Yeah, I, I guess I, I don't want to stay here all night talking about this, but I, it's in this day and age where there are more and more robust offerings across technologies, it's my hope that we'll be able to meet the needs of everybody who wants to study what they want to study in their chosen path so that they can get where they want to be. And, and I thank you, too, for working hard on that, and Ms. High as well. Thank you. Uh, if I could just shift gears for a moment, uh, I wanted to take a moment, and she's going to kill me, to recognize one of Falls Church City Public Schools' finest. Uh, Amy Kurjanowicz has been a staple of FCPS <laughs> community for over 20 years. Her willingness to take on any role is really what sets her apart from the crowd. By the official title, she is Director of Counseling for George Mason. But let me tell you a list of some of her unofficial roles. Mentor, teacher counselor, shoulder to cry on, master schedule guru, as you just saw, administrator, leader, friend, and most importantly, the heartbeat of George Mason. Here's a little story for you. Each year we develop our master schedule, as you see, and Amy's office becomes a revolving door. Everyone thinks it's because teachers want to request certain schedules or discuss class numbers. That's not really the case. Let's be honest, the truth is the entire staff recognizes that Amy is the most incredible listener in the world. She never judges and has a heart of gold. Staff members are actually lining up outside her door for free counseling. Please join me in congratulating Amy on her retirement. Words cannot express how much she will be missed to everyone. I know Chairman Webb has a few words. <laughs> Amy, before, well, you get, you, before you get away, let me. Yes. I just want to, to add my thanks. Uh, you've not only been a person I've worked with in my day job in the college counseling world for a number of years now before getting involved in what goes on here in the city of Falls Church. Um, but have also become a, a, a friend. And it's, it's it been a pleasure over these years to get to know you both personally and professionally, both in our individual day jobs, but also of uh, being a member of the school board and seeing what you do for, for all the students here in the city uh, and hearing Matt share a little bit more about all that you do for a little bit of everybody over at George Mason. Uh, I understand why that they're gonna, gonna miss you and your pretty big shoes to fill. And I just wanted to add my personal uh, thanks for, for what you've done and, and your friendship over these years. Thank you so much. As you learned a few minutes ago, I'm not a woman of few words. I don't mind saying what I feel I need to say, but right now I'm pretty speechless, <laughs> pretty surprised. Thank you to all the board members, 
Thank you, Lawrence, for your friendship over the years and how much you've done for our kids at George Mason. You helped them and you helped their families before you were in this position. So thank you so much for that. Dr. Schiller, thank you for allowing me to work with Matt and to continue to develop this schedule. I'm not leaving until it's done. Matt, Matt started off by saying his grandfather had this, what, 5,000 piece puzzle that was never completed. I promise you this schedule will be completed before I leave. The kids will have a schedule and the teachers will have a schedule. Lisa, thank you for everything. And I, I can't even say any more, thank you. And Dr. Noonan, I wish you the best of luck. You're in a fantastic place. You're with wonderful people. You're gonna love our kids. I mean, they're just, they're fantastic and our staff is fantastic. And Matt, I've been through a lot of superintendents here, assistant superintendents and principals. Matt, thank you for everything you've done and you're doing and you are on a great path. George Mason is very lucky. Thank you all again. We're going to move on to uh, 3.02, discussion with Jesse Thacker Preschool, Mount Daniel, and TJ staff on educational impact for proposed school grade configuration. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Schiller. As we discussed a couple of weeks ago, uh, upon board request, to hear from staff from our schools uh, who may be impacted by some decisions that you have to make in the future. And so what I've asked is our school principal and uh, selected members of the staff that uh, to come to us tonight and to have an open discussion with the board and an engagement about some of the um, impacts and some of the plans, some of the current situations they find themselves in with our facility and delivering our program, and to talk with the board as the board wishes to engage in a discussion. I think it's uh, very worthwhile and for this opportunity. And it'll also give uh, Dr. Noonan a chance to hear directly from his staff-to-be uh, about um, some of the tough decisions that we're facing and some of the situations that we are facing every day in our facilities. So with that in mind, um, this fine group here before you stand ready to answer questions. Uh, let us just go around here. Um, Ms. Germer, would you please introduce those members of your staff who are with us today? I'm delighted to introduce to you, we have Rachel Hamburger to my left. She's our on-site preschool supervisor. Uh, we also have Cindy Dreschler, who is one of our preschool teachers. She's been with us for two years. And Nora Rosenberger, who has, I think, a child in every single school in this division. So she brings that background as well as a first-year teacher at Jesse Thackeray. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Swanson, members of the uh, Thomas Jefferson Elementary School staff. Hi, very pleased to introduce Ms. Julie Custer, second grade teacher, and Ms. Christopher, Mr. Mr. Christopher Barnes, third grade teacher. And uh, Ms. Kelly. Hi, um, I would like to introduce Mrs. Karen Bevan, who is a current kindergarten teacher and former preschool teacher when the preschool was at Mount Daniel, and Mrs. Nan Hoff, longstanding kindergarten teacher at Mount Daniel, and Mr. Jeremy Ferrara, our assistant principal tonight. Very good, thank you. Um, perhaps just uh, to start off a little bit, Paul, why don't you kick off a little bit since we just uh, were mentioning uh, Thomas Jefferson a while ago. Absolutely. Um, as always, thank you very much for all of your work and your time tonight as we wrestle with the mother of all growth problems. Um, this board has heard me speak on numerous occasions about the status of TJ relative to our current class size. And so it little profits us, I suppose, for me to repeat all those details, but um, I do think that it's important to remember that at the present time, we do not have any empty instructional spaces. Should we need to add an encore teacher? Should we need to add a general education teacher? 
we do not have that space right now. We would have to make some profound shifts that um, would leave us in a position, I think, of choosing the least poor option that's out there. I also think it's important to understand that because of the raw size of TJ, there is a direct correlation to that size and in instructional time. For instance, at the present time, we have 36 homerooms. And as we try to cycle those 36 classes through six different encores, we necessarily have to decrease the amount of instructional time if we are going to fulfill our responsibility to allow every kid to access each one of those encores on a weekly basis. It's also important to remember that as our building has grown not only in students and staff, we have also grown into a building that has no meaningful place to hold a staff meeting. We have a library that might be able to comfortably hold 60 or so adults with a staff of nearly 110. That too has direct implications for kids proving, uh, trying to present school-wide professional development is exceedingly difficult. I think it's also important to remember that even our non-instructional spaces have suffered as we've seen enrollment flood over our school. As of today, as of May the 2nd, we have 826 kids at TJ and we have one bed in the health room. We also have an office space that is not designed with basic privacy concerns in mind. As soon as visitors come in our school, they immediately peer into the health room to see any number of issues that are going on there. Uh, Mr. Hills mentioned this earlier in a conversation I had with our secretary today. She noted that roughly five years or so ago, we would add roughly 40 students over the course of a summer. Today, we are adding well over 120 each summer. And there are some implications to that. Given the registration process here in Falls Church, it's not at all uncommon to see lines, even during, during the school day, of parents coming in. And the registration process is important. There is sometimes sensitive and confidential information that ex exchanged in those settings. Doing that in a place where we really don't have any other venue for that becomes problematic. Mrs. Custer and Mr. Barnes are here tonight to talk about some of the direct implications for kids. And then we also wish for you to hear a little bit about the, an idea that has surfaced in the community regarding second grade. It's come to our attention that there is an idea that we might be willing to split second grade on a short-term basis, send some of our second graders to Mount Daniel while keeping some here at TJ. <coughs> and before I turn that over to Mrs. Custer, I'd like to speak on that a little bit. Um, Julie will speak of this, but there, there are some very significant issues that this board needs to be thinking of if that idea comes to the table. First of all, you will see that that will result in a very meaningful difference in the second grade education that kids at Mount Daniel get versus the ones that remain at TJ. Grade level planning for the primary years program will become exceedingly and exponentially difficult. And while this board has certainly shown a willingness to take on tough decisions, it should go without saying that should that idea go forward, this board would be faced with a massive political challenge to determine which families will go to Thomas Jefferson and which families will remain at Mount Daniel. This is a short-term solution at best. It's also true that, but it's forgotten that the positions that you are in are public service positions. These are service positions, and sometimes it is exceedingly difficult to render that service. So we, we don't envy you. But I think it's also important to remember that I think as the months go forward, this board has a chance to truly, truly serve this community in a lasting way. A renovation at Thomas Jefferson would do much to solve and alleviate the strains that I have enumerated tonight and on other occasions where we have come together. 
It will allow for natural growth. It will allow for additional Encore teachers should that be appropriate. And I think more than anything, should a renovation at TJ go forward, the most valuable commodity that it may bestow on this community is that will alleviate the constant strain and uncertainty that our kids and our families face. I will bet you all the change in my pocket that there is not a person in this room that wants to come back to this venue one year from now and in these chambers still be facing uncertainty about what lies ahead. So I would encourage you to think big. That's going to take political will. It will be hard. At Thomas Jefferson, we will be with you every step of the way, and we will stand ready to do our part. I'd like to turn it actually over now to Mr. Barnes to talk about what some of these odor overcrowding issues might look like relative to a classroom teacher. Um, put up on the screen here what I had alluded to last uh, two weeks ago. Aaron and Paul had identified for us about some of the substandard um, aspects of what the building has created for them to work with. And so what you see screen, uh, rolled on the screen here and what you see um, in your uh, packet here are those particular issues that they've identified that staff will be talking about a little bit as well as how we are struggling. And this is here for TJ, but uh, we'll also roll that a little bit later for Mount Daniel. So let me, now that I gave you that setup. <laughs> well, thank you very much for letting us have the time to speak to you this evening about this issue. Um, I'm a third grade teacher, as was mentioned earlier. I often work with special needs students, uh, and so I have some direct interactions with our special education department through that lens. I also have some students who uh, in, or have had over the course of the years students who are duly identified, um, special education and as English learners. Um, so. I am familiar with the challenges uh, and the needs of both of these populations. They are our most vulnerable right now in Falls Church City. They're also the populations that we are struggling to serve effectively. And they also are the populations whose services are currently being provided in hallways and closets at Thomas Jefferson. And I, I am not being, uh, I'm not overstating it when I say closets. There are literally two ESOL teachers in our building who uh, we took over book closets so that they could actually have some kind of space to pull a small group. Um, students are also meeting in the hallways. And that in some ways seems like a great use of space until you realize how many transitions there are with 800 plus children going back and forth between lunch, recess, and encore throughout the course of the day. And as well as our transitions for our tiger paws, which is our intervention and enrichment block. And that brings me to another area where overcrowding is affecting us. Um, we have a very large identified academically talented and gifted population. And that is the, because of the way our program works in the district, those students are often having their services during our intervention and enrichment block time. Those class sizes are often bordering around 30, which is significantly higher than what you would see in a standard classroom. That is also true in many cases for the general education classes during the Tiger Paws block. So the impacts of the overcrowding right now are pretty far reaching. And as uh, Mr. Swanson said, the solution is not an easy one and I don't know it. But I wanted to make sure that you were aware of some of the ways that this is creeping through the building and uh, rippling out in ways that wouldn't necessarily uh, just be apparent to a classroom teacher. Oh, and I apologize. Um, I did want to also introduce Julie Custer from second grade. Um, we do, as I said, know that this is a big issue and there does need to be a solution, but we're hoping that you might consider another solution than the one Mr. Swanson just previously mentioned for the reasons he outlined and the ones Julie will share with you as well. Hi, y'all make me nervous. <laughs> Excuse me if I read these thoughts. The following thoughts, um, I'm Julie Custer and I'm one of the team leaders of second grade. The following thoughts are a consensus of the entire second grade team. We believe splitting the second grade team would create inequity in the following second and third order effects. First, the logistics of collaboration and common planning. Not having common planning would inhibit our ability to maintain a strong cohesive curriculum 
across all subject areas. We believe having subteams creates inequity, especially when in two different locations. Second, we already have issues at TJ being able to share the limited number of supplies and curriculum books across eight classrooms and maybe nine next year. Having to split these materials would create even more issues. Third, moving some classes to Mount Daniel would add to the staffing and scheduling for extra specialists. You saw SPED, ACE, reading and counseling. We're not sure how this would be addressed. Fourth, would all second graders get equitable encore? There is currently no STEAM class offered at Mount Daniel. And finally, we feel there would be a tremendous socio-emotional um, aspect for the rising second graders of who stays at Mount Daniel and who goes to TJ. This would also create an uh, inequity. Thank you. Um, Aaron, let's talk a little bit about uh, um, what we have now and what we're going to be able to look at starting um, in October of 2018 or November. Sure. So first, thank you for voting for continuing on with our project despite the limitations placed on us by Fairfax County with our class size. And thank you to the city council as well for our additional funding for our project. I know that was not an easy decision, but some of the reasons why we needed it to move forward, regardless of who's going to join us in the building, are similar to what Mr. Swanson mentioned at TJ. Currently, all of our classrooms inside the building have classrooms in them. There's no specials inside the building, so we have eight kindergarten classes and nine first grade classes, which fill all of our full-size rooms in the school. Um, those eight kindergarten classes, as you know, are above capacity, so there are 24 or 25 students per class. We have requested an additional kindergarten teacher for next year. Without the construction, we would have nowhere to put that teacher inside the school. Um, in our nine first grade classrooms, those rooms are not all the same size. Three of them are much smaller. One was the library, which was converted to a classroom. Two others were used for music in the past and other specials in the past, so they actually can only hold 20 students, which makes the other classrooms have to take on more students, so some teachers have 23 or 24 students in their class. Um, our special ed teachers are in resource room spaces, so there's two smaller spaces that house our two special education teachers. We did request a, an additional special education teacher for next year that currently does not have a space to move into despite the needs for our programming. So we're looking at teachers having to share space or working out some kind of schedule because those kids, um, like Mr. Barnes alluded to, need a space to learn, not the hallway, especially <laughs> at our age level. <laughs> um, our one speech therapist does have a resource room space. She does pull out groups with students. We have a reading specialist that has a pull out space. Um, one of our reading paraprofessionals who works with our struggling readers and our ESOL, ESOL students currently teaches in the hallway um, down by the reading specialist. And then our two ESOL teachers are in resource room spaces, one of which is a very small space that quite frankly only has room for a table and the teacher and the children. It's difficult even for Jeremy and I to get in there to observe because when there's kids in the room, the door doesn't open <laughs> the whole way. <laughs> but they make it work. Um, we have one additional space for special needs students that houses our occupational therapist, physical therapist, and our behavior specialist, which on any given day they can plan, but if we have a student who needs a space to calm down or to have a time out, often they are then kicking someone out of that space that is doing therapy with another student. Um, we have a guidance counselor in a resource room space. He pulls anywhere from one to six students at a time. Um, our enrichment teacher, Mrs. Green, is in a closet off of the multi-purpose room. So you can hear the PE classes in there, and it is a closet. She does a great job making it work, but it is a very small space. Um, the art room does have one class at a time all day long. The library is currently in a temporary trailer facility outside, so it can only hold about 50% of our collection. The other 50% is in storage until we do the construction and have a full-size library once again. Um, the music room is in a temporary trailer facility, which honestly for her is an upgrade from my first year here when she was on a cart. Um, she does a great job with... Um, instruments and teaching the kids to play various instruments, which you can imagine it's difficult to cart 
10 xylophones around the school. So that very greatly impacted her program. And if we would have had to add classroom teachers without the expansion, she and the Spanish teacher would be the ones that would be removed from their spaces first. The Spanish room is currently in a trailer as well, um, and she would have space in the new building for quite some time. There is no Spanish room technically planned for the building, but looking at the enrollment coming up, especially if preschool were to join us, she would have space for quite some time. Um, some other things that we will be gaining with the new building would be a meeting space for staff. We also currently do not have anywhere to meet. We use our largest classroom when all of staff meets, which is room 10. <laughs> Mrs. Marple is very gracious to always give us her room, um, but you can imagine how 60 adults fitting into one classroom for any kind of lengthy meeting is not um, the best. Um, our health room also is quite small. We have one bed and almost 400 students and little people come to the clinic quite often. <laughs> um, our office setup is also not ideal in terms of privacy. Our secretaries actually are split up currently and one of them sits in a vestibule in the hallway and the other one sits in the main office but does not have much privacy. A little more than Thomas Jefferson thinks our visitors don't come directly into that space, but she do does still have to talk with families and we don't have a conference room, so she doesn't have a place to take families um, for that. Also, our lack of conference room means that any meetings we have with families typically take place in my office because it's the largest space that we have for things like that, but it can be intimidating for some families, especially if it's a student with special needs that has a lot of related service providers. Those meetings can get to be 10 to 15 people all crammed into one office. Seems very intimidating to the parents when it, there's no need for it to be. It's just not the most comfortable setup. Um, so those are things we're excited to gain. In terms of preschool versus second grade, I mean, honestly, either one Program-wise, is fine with us. You know, they're both a very good fit. Our concern is the space and how quickly we would run out of space. Um, we definitely agree with Thomas Jefferson's sent sentiment that splitting up the kids would be very difficult. I mean, Mount Daniel and TJ are two very different places, so I think it would be hard to maintain our current climate and have second grade feel like second grade for half of the kids. I think that would be a real challenge. Um, I also think that um, inviting second grade to come for a short time would be hard on you guys. I mean, we would be happy to have you, but just building a cohesive climate and culture for a short amount of time I think is going to be hard on those teachers and on us if, then, if we know that's a short period of time. But we also understand the extreme needs that they have, and if we have the space, we know that you guys might need to make that decision. But... Preschool was at Mount Daniel in the past, and so that's why Mrs. Bevan is here, because she was a preschool teacher at Mount Daniel. Um, so I know she has prepared some remarks of things she would like to share about that program and some positives from preschool being included with our instructional program. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> Thank you so much for giving us this time to speak and for listening to our concerns and our thoughts. Um, we do feel, or I feel, um, bringing Mount Dan preschool back to Mount Daniel is a developmentally appropriate situation. Um, not that second grade wouldn't be as well. Um, but speaking as a former Mount Daniel preschool teacher who taught in five different locations over 11 years, <laughs> including an off-campus office building, a relocatable and a permanent classroom at Mount Daniel, as well as sites at TJ and Mary Ellen Henderson, JTP was a great solution to giving the preschool a permanent home. Um, but I also think it took away one thing that we were able to give our littlest learners. Um, <clears throat> and it was different than what other preschoolers were receiving. One of the most important things that we were able to give them, whether it was our special needs students, our family literacy program, or our typical peers, was stability. For both the students and parents, it is a big and often scary step to begin kindergarten, regardless of whether they have attended preschool in, in the past or not. Being a part of Mount Daniel gave those little friends and their families a smoother transition. They knew the building, they knew the staff, they even knew what to expect for specials and were very excited about it. <laughs> um, their families established a relationship with the staff, which made it easier for them to navigate the system. Um, one thing being part of the family literacy program, it was really 
wonderful to see the families would come in and barely be comfortable speaking just to us as the teachers. And by the time their children were going off to kindergarten, they were you know, talking with us, they were advocating for themselves, for their children, volunteering in field trips and you know, volunteering to help art classes and things. And it was just a privilege to see them develop as well as the children. Um, for the children, it took away the mo most of that component of the unknown and it let them focus on the important things like getting to know their new teachers and their new friends, their new rules and schedules, feeling comfortable enough to focus on what they were learning. So that was one of the things that Mrs. Haleko and the preschool staff loved about our program and felt that was so important. And it was the thing that made us even more special than the other area preschoolers. I'm here to say that I agree with everything that Karen Bevan just said. <laughs> I'm Nan Hoff. I've been at Mount Daniel um, for over 20 years. Um, so I was there um, the whole time that preschool was there. It's a wonderful scenario. Having them come back is something we would look forward to. Um, like Karen said, having our youngest learners um, in one place for several years before they have to make a huge transition to another school um, is a really good idea. Um, that being said, we were all ready to welcome second grade to come and join us. Um, so if that ends up being what is the best decision um, for even a couple of years, then we would uh, you know, welcome them with open arms as well. Um, I would caution against um, separating the grade, breaking it up. Um, as a longtime member of the kindergarten team, I couldn't imagine having to make that decision who goes where and which families go to which school. So um, I would... I would not support that decision. Thank you, um, Elizabeth and Rachel and members of uh, Thackeray. Since we've been talking about that school, we th I thought I'd leave the uh, best for last. <laughs> Very good. Um, well, we love, our, we love Gertie. We would not want to lose our Gertie. Um, but we you know, love our little school. But we also realize we want to do what's best for all the children in, in the school system as a whole. Um, I, we have talked a little bit. I want the teachers to share their thoughts and Rachel to share their thoughts. Um, from my perspective, there are pros in terms of the things that Ms. Bevan mentioned with continuity and less transitions. Um, there's also positives in terms of some of the management components, having a health room aide, having office staff, having someone to do registration, I think would really help us put more of Rachel's time into some of our child find duties and responsibilities. We are doing those now, but you can only spend as much time as you have available. And as someone mentioned, little ones come to the clinic a lot. We get on average how many visits a day at least? Like 10? seven, eight a day, um, every one of which has to be recorded, things entered in power school, protocols followed, and so, you know, that's Rachel. So um, I think some of those procedural things and that support would really be helpful for our preschool students. There are logistics that would have to be worked out. Ms. Kelly and I already talked a little bit, things about arrival time and bus and kind of getting into the weeds of things you don't want to be deciding now, but just to know that those are things that we're identifying that should that decision be made, there are some things we definitely need to work through. Um, staff hours, all of those kinds of things would be impacted. So I'll let Rachel go ahead. Hi, I'm Rachel Hamburger. I'm the preschool supervisor. Um, I am I have mixed feelings about moving. I love our little building, but for all the reasons that Ms. Grummer said and Ms. Bevan said, I think it would be beneficial to make that move to Mount Daniel. Um, I also think for our students with special needs, it would make a big difference. Uh, it would give them that continuity. And also for our ESOL students, it would give teachers the opportunity to come down and see the students um, before they move up to kindergarten, because right now it's a big deal to get teachers over for meetings for IEPs and to get teachers over to observe students. There's a lot of coordination that has to happen, um, and it would be really nice for them to just be able to pop in and see the students before they move up to kindergarten. So, 
I think just to piggyback with that, I agree that we love our little building, our little community, our little yellow school. Um, I think the benefit to the kids of having that continuity, I'm gonna wholeheartedly agree with that. To piggyback with Rachel on the benefits to the staff, I think um, sometimes we do have a fairly small teaching staff at, at JTP right now. Um, we have six. Six? Yes, six. <laughs> we have six teachers. And I think um, it would be great for us to be able to just do a little bit more collaboration in the school community. I think sometimes we do get a little bit isolated over at our school. And we kind of sometimes, I think, feel like we're not part of the bigger community as much as we would like to be. And I think being with the Mount Daniel staff and having that, um, that community would be really good for the staff as well. It's all been said, but I, I, I fully agree that I think it's a great to, um, to have that smooth transaction to kindergarten because that is, that's a big transaction and to make that kind of a non-issue is great. I also think it would be nice for some of our peer models that we have in our classroom that are peer models for kiddos with special needs to have older peer models that they see in the hallway. Oh, look how those first graders walk in the hallway. You know, we can um, use them as peer models for our own little peer models. So there's lots of benefits. Uh, thank you all very much for, for coming out tonight and giving us some great information. And I'll see if the, our, some of our board members have questions for you while we have you all here tonight. Any, any questions? Mr. Lawrence? Paul's got some. Um, first, thank you. Um, I think you realize that we are officially the choir, so you, know, you don't have to sell us on uh, lack of space and things like that. But the fact that you all came out here tonight and there are people watching. I'm amazed at the people who go and watch the recordings of these meetings. So um, you're, you're talking to a lot more than just us. The idea of, of splitting second grade is one of those things where it almost makes logical sense because it just seems like, okay, you've got this number, you divide it in two and you put them and then it, it works as long as you're not working with humans. I mean, that's, that's the basic problem. Um, I got to admit, I'm surprised that people seemed not, not happy, but comfortable with the idea of Jesse Thackeray, you know, moving back to Mount Daniel. I was, you know, expecting a little more pushback on that, but, you know, the idea of having them with the older kids, I mean, I completely get it because, you know, kids literally look up to other kids and it makes a big difference. Um, one thing for you, Paul, when you first started talking, I wrote down, you talked about how, you know, we have filled every instructional space we have. And I wrote it down with a big WTF next to it because my first thought was, that doesn't sound so bad. And then when Christopher started talking, I, I think he hit what I think you need to get in presentations and what Aaron and, and Mount Daniel has done. How many of your instructional spaces are not actually instructional spaces? Because the way you said it, I'm like, okay, we've got all these nice, wonderful classrooms, and they're filled. Well, that's true, but so are the closets and the halls and the, hopefully never the stairwells and things like that. So I think that's something that people really don't understand about TJ yet. They know it's, it's overcrowded, but when we you know, took pictures of the you know, the room behind the stage, the stage that no longer exists, the library that doesn't exist, you know, at Mount Daniel, people really got it then. So I think you're, you're selling your case a little too short. So don't be, don't be the nice guy. Be, uh, be completely honest, but, you know, make it clear as to just the situation you're in because it's, it's way too crowded. And at this point, a temporary solution isn't a solution at all for you. I mean, that's really the point. You can juggle only so long and we've kind of run out of arms. Ms. Gill? I first want to say thank you so much for coming out. Some of you have taught my children. Um, some of you may teach my children and someone calls me regularly with head injuries. <laughs> only once a week, Ms. Rachel calls me because Henry has hit his head on something. Um, so I know how busy you are. Um, it's helpful to hear from you because it's one thing for us to say we think this is a good idea, but we aren't educators and we're not in the building, so it's helpful to have your perspective. And if you know anything changes and you say actually we thought about more and this would, it please bring that to us because I don't think it's. I think most of my colleagues would agree that 
we want to do what's best for the children, and nobody knows what's best for the children more than you. So thank you so much for coming out tonight. Mr. Ankuma. I'll piggyback on that. Thank you not only for coming out, but for putting up with these conditions. And that's all I'm going to leave with. Thank you so much. I'd also like to thank all of you because I know how busy you are and I know how hard you all work all day. Um, and I'm really grateful that you came forward about this idea about second grade because as a teacher, when I first heard that, I thought, how are they going to plan? How are those kids, you know, how are they going to, how are they going to make this work? I couldn't even imagine. So thank you. I know, you know, a lot of thought and effort went into this presentation and I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, and thank you again to all of you for coming out at this increasingly late hour. Just a couple of questions. The first is, I think everybody has suggested, but I just want to make sure, do you, do you think going into this that there's any way to split second grade and ensure that every child would receive the same quality education that everybody else did? Does anybody think that's possible? Okay, so I just wanted to make sure about that. but. I think the other thing, though, that is a question, and, and I don't know that you all can answer it, but it is a question that's floating out there, and that is, if you have Mount Daniel renovated and it's not yet at capacity, what's a productive way to make use of that excess space? And I think that was one of the ideas propelling that splitting second grade. So I, I get why not splitting second grade might not be a good idea, but. But I do think it would help us as a board if we can work with you all and come to a productive way to use that space going forward while it's not fully utilized uh, because we haven't made the accommodations or transitions. So, Can I speak to that a little bit, just looking at the new building? Um, one thing that we talked about the last time we were at the construction meeting um, was the class size in preschool and having that number of 660 being our cap on the school, not really accurately reflecting the number of instructional spaces. So there's 30 classrooms in the new building. Currently we have 17, hopefully 18, and preschool has six. So that doesn't leave very many empty rooms. But if you look at that preschool classes are 10, 12, 15 kids, you have a classroom that's not at the 22 to 25. So if you look at the total number of kids, yes, it's going to seem much lower than that 660. But it's not like we're going to have a whole floor of the building without people in it. Um, some other things that we have already considered doing is, I mentioned the Spanish teacher not having a permanent space. We would give her a room so she wouldn't have to be on a cart. Um, some of the special ed teachers that do share spaces, if we have the available space, we would split them up to best meet the needs of the kids so there aren't so many students in one place. Occupational therapy, PT, OT, I mean, I don't want to get too in the weeds, but those are disciplines that have a lot of stuff that come with them. <laughs> and right now we don't even have spaces for all of our things that are up to code. For example, a swing for occupational therapy. Students with sensory needs need a swing, but the room has to be so big to fit the swing so it doesn't fall off the ceiling or hit a wall or whatever. So right now we have no swing. So those are things that it would be nice to be able to have in place and to use the building as we need it. Now, if we need to welcome some friends from central office or wherever, you know, we can make that work too. But don't you worry, we will not leave any rooms <laughs> completely right, well, that's, that's, untouched if we good. have them. Thank you. But the 30 number is something yeah. that is different than the 660 will look, especially with preschool keeping their class sizes how they are. Something that Aaron touched on for the board to keep be mindful of going forward, it isn't so much the enrollment, it's the functional capacity of a building, how the building can be utilized to support your program. And as you were just pointing out there, when you look at special needs, for example, with special equipment, you're not going to be looking at your 2022, but you're looking at the functional capacity of what a room or a building can offer. I guarantee you that um, whatever decision that you and Dr. Newton make going forward in, in conversation with your staff is that, one, the need to build that a uh, new addition or for Mount Daniel was preeminent. We all knew that. And number two, that space is going to be used very wonderfully so that the program can be delivered as designed. 
and you'll be proud of that. I think we're very proud of where the Thackeray School is at this point. And we, I think, looking forward, and you're going to find that uh, if you make that decision, this very talented staff and the leaders of these buildings are going to make the new Mount Daniel serving whatever grades you have, in this case pre-K, K-1, that they're going to be able to do things that they can't do at this time in either buildings. And without, you know, as was pointed out here, there'll be side benefits in terms of um, teacher to teacher, the vertical and horizontal communications, alignment, and support staff that are so necessary to be able to integrate. And as they all pointed out, for parents, to being able to have a home for three consecutive years for the youngest ones can bring added benefits. And as we pointed out here, you have an elastic number. I don't know what demand there will be in the future, but I bet you that if you're able to open up more spaces for more preschools, you're going to have them knocking at your door. And one of the issues that we'll be talking about a little bit later just has been raised as discussion, many school districts have initiated transitional classes for those who are not quite ready for prime time kindergarten and for those children who might need that transition between K and one. I've implemented it in many districts since the 1980s around the country. And research is starting to bear out what this may mean because so many of our children are having preschool experiences and are ready. So I think the world is open for you to really put together many options for this community. And I think going forward to Mount Daniel and with the talent and the knowledge of the staff and through Dr. Noonan's leadership, you're going to well be able to position Mount Daniel to serve whatever student you want, but in a far better capacity, a far better way than you ever had. So <clears throat> I'd also like to thank all of you for coming out. Um, I have a couple of other questions I want to ask while we've got the benefit of this expert panel uh, here. Um, the, the main questions I think that we, that you addressed are exactly what we wanted to hear about. Um, I think there was a lot of concern that splitting Splitting a grade would not make any sense for all of the reasons that, you know, even to people like us who are not trained educators, um, doesn't sound like it makes sense. Um, and it's good to hear that, you know, it's good to have the data from the experts. Um, we've also, I think, looking back, avoided sort of the doomsday scenario. So the doomsday scenario was Mount Daniel is not expanded, and now we're looking at TJ may being a one to six school with 1,300 students in the near future. And that, you know, I think is something nobody wanted as well. Um, I'm thinking about you know, one of the things I'd like to hear a little bit more about, because I also heard, you know, in terms of grade configuration, PK probably goes a little better with K1 than it does standing alone, but it can work either way. Two can go with one or go up with three, and it, it, it'll work. Um, what I'd like to hear a little bit more about is because what we're trying to do as we build this out is we've got, you know, different, we've got, we know when Mount Daniel's going to come off, but we're trying to figure out when the George Mason construction, if it's approved, when that takes place, what happens at TJ. And there may be a lot of moving pieces over the near future. So, you know, one option, which we've tried to avoid, is second grade pops back to Mount Daniel. And it might just be for a year, or if the projections last a little longer, two years, which is, you know, exceedingly disruptive. Um, <clears throat> but the choice may be, does it pop back, or, you know, are we, you know, setting up outdoor amphitheaters for classrooms? So it'd be just, I'd like to hear a little bit more about how much just moving a grade might disrupt if for a year or two, whether, whether it would be better for the students and the teachers to be a little bit more crowded for a little longer or to move for a year. And um, uh, Mr. Swanson, from you in particular, you know, one of the other options is gonna be, you know, does, do we need to consider as an interim option until TJ construction is complete, depending on how things get done, whether fifth grade, pops up to a George Mason MEH expansion for a year, particularly if not all of the George Mason building comes down. Um, so there's a possibility that that might need to bubble up, and I don't know <coughs> what effect it would have on the program if you had you know, an upper level elementary class sort of associated with 
the middle school for a year or two years or whatever that turns out to be. So those are the, the, the two questions I, I'd like to hear a little bit more about. As is always the case, it's a couple thoughtful questions that you ask. Um, it, it's hard to answer that question, frankly, in the absence of looking at options for renovation. It really is. Fundamentally, I think the question is, how do the possible renovation options at TJ play out? Is it possible to keep fifth grade there during a renovation? Is it possible to keep second grade there? I don't know. I think one of the things that comes to mind when you think about fifth grade, one of the core elements of the PYP program is exhibition. That is the cornerstone. It's the hallmark of a kid's PYP experience. And that is typically done at the oldest grade level at a building. So if we were to move fifth grade over, how would that impact exhibition? I don't know. I don't know. Um, I suspect there would be some complexities to that. I think beyond that, I don't know that I'm in a position to, to be able to answer with any great detail the very legitimate question that you're asking. I think probably my best guess is that knowing the staff members of FCCPS, anything that this board asks us to do, I think can be done well on a short-term and possibly a long-term basis. I wanted you to answer first because you can uh, <laughs> speak to your space needs, you know, because that's really what we're balancing here. We have the space to take second grade if they want to come for the short term. Um, I do think some things to consider with that short-term type of move is what we would be asking those teachers to do. And who knows, maybe if you, know, you need more classrooms and there's no space for them, you would rather do the things I'm about to mention than have 25 kids in your class. You know, I can't answer that for them, but any kind of school-wide initiatives, would we expect them to adapt to ours or knowing that they're going to go back would they kind of get to keep their own i'm thinking like in terms of pbis like we do hippo hoorays do you guys even i don't you guys do tiger stripes tiger so stripes. it's a similar thing do we call it the same thing therefore dividing the school or do we expect those teachers to learn something new which i think is totally fine if it's a long-term plan but the amount of time they're going to spend learning something new for a year or two, we have to weigh those options. Um, I've watched our first grade teachers pack up classrooms once before, and then we didn't do construction, and it was not pretty. I'm hoping that they cleaned out quite a bit so it won't be quite as hard this time, <laughs> but that takes a lot of time to pack up an entire classroom and move all of those resources to do it for the short term. Um, something else that Paul mentioned was PYP. I do believe that if second grade were to come to Mount Daniel, they would be expected to do exhibition. The reason we aren't expected to do it currently is because we don't have three grades. Preschool's a little different because it's not all of the kids, but if second grade were to come, I think we would either need to be okay with getting a matter to be addressed from IB saying your second grade teacher should be doing exhibition, knowing that that doesn't really make sense with ours, or it's a lot of work for those teachers to learn how to do that, to then move back to TJ and not have to do it anymore. So it's all work that is, you know, everyone here is willing to do and everyone here goes above and beyond what they need to do. But I think that there's a lot of time that teachers will spend learning new things and adjusting to new things that are for a short term. And I think it'll be, it'll be hard, quite frankly, to ask them to do that. However, if there's no space to put additional classrooms and the class sizes get too big, that's additional teacher time too. So I, I really think it comes down to the projections and how quickly some of these other options for TJ could be put together, I think will help us to better answer your question and weigh all of those. Thank you both. I, 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 it's an unfair question. I fully understand <laughs> that. Uh, but these are the sorts of things that we're going to have to weigh as we go forward. I'd only ask that all of you stay involved in the process because, you know, look, one thing I'd never want to ask, I think none of us want to ask any of you is to, you know, to take another one for the team. Right, so we shouldn't be in a position of trying to say, yeah, we're asking you to do this, please suck it up and get it done. We actually want to try to make decisions that, you know, make you suck it up less. Um, so <laughs> just stay involved, keep talking. You're, you're, you and the students are our constituency, so thank you very much for your dedication.
Just, just a quick follow-up question with respect to IB. Is there a way to get waivers on certain of those requirements that you mentioned so that fifth grade, um, if it went somewhere else, could still be treated as, you know, TJ centric even because they're moving back is there is there any flexibility in the system or is it pretty rigid that I I don't know we would have to apply for it and honestly it's up to them um, I, I don't know of any other school that's ever requested something like this what Ivy would say is that the exhibition would have to be done in fourth grade because it's the last grade that's at that school for for that year so fourth grade would be required to do exhibition which in turn would mean that technically those same kids would have to do another exhibition one year later. If fifth grade came back. The year fifth grade oh, comes they back, they back, they would. They'd be learning a lot. <laughs> You've heard me mention that TJ and your decision is the linchpin of everything else that will follow. And again, just to look at the scenario, I had tried to play around with putting grade five in the middle school. And you can see how it jumps immediately to well over capacity for the school in 2018, 2019, and thereafter. And so if the enrollments hold through the organic growth and just placing the number of students that we project for fifth grade into Henderson, um, that option is, is going to cause you some difficulties, as you can see, for, one, for the 15-month period of con possible construction. <coughs> it's no easy answer. Again, I want to uh, thank you all very much for coming out and spending a little time with us this evening. Uh, we're not as bad as you. You, have also, you, you, you. you did a great job. Look, you did a great job in, in doing that. And this was not rehearsed. But, <laughs> but uh, again, thank you all very much for thank coming you. out and spending time thank with us tonight. Y'all have, have a good evening. Thank you so much. If I could ask Paul and um, Aaron and possibly and Liz to stay for a couple more minutes for this just as next item because the impact that it has on your school. You can stay right where you are. Thanks, guys. Okay. okay. Uh, the next discussion is about the bail transportation schedule for 2017-2018 school year. Yes, what we wanted to share with you for your consideration is what we have been looking at this winter with regard to a bell schedule as it affects our schools and the transportation uh, schedule and the implications. And we've 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 looked at this and the administrators feel that there are significant advantages for your consideration uh, for a change um, we're restricted right now your your bell schedule has been really driven by availability of buses you know right now we have 14 buses and the preschool and the high school morning buses run concurrently and what, what is being considered and recommended for your consideration is by adding one more bus, which is in the budget, and by starting preschool 20 minutes later, that would be at 820, okay, then where we combine the um, George Mason and the Henderson ridership in the afternoon, this would allow us to change to combine the Mason and the Henderson morning runs by using all 15 buses, and you would have a common drop-off time of 7.45. What is important here is that it gives to us a common starting time for those schools, and if Matt was still here, he could speak to what that means for scheduling, particularly those courses where the students from MEH and the high school are sharing courses or enrolled in the same courses. Um, and here are some of the benefits that we think. Right now, as I understand it, um, and Lisa, you'll help me out with this, right? George Mason students are dropped off, and they have a 30 minutes wait time before the start of school. And it, by eliminating the late arrival of the morning buses at Henderson, okay, uh, we often experience now a very tight turnaround of the bus routes. And 
by providing, this would provide additional access to late buses for the Henderson students. Currently, we only have three late runs per week, whereas GM has a late run every school day. Um, I think we all know what kind of traffic impact there is on Haycock Road, and um, we have a lot of parents who drop their students off so that they don't have to wait the 30 minutes. So we're looking at a way in which we could perhaps increase the efficiency and effectiveness of our bus route and, and also address some of the safety issues we have there. Obviously, I mentioned to you the instructional schedules would be aligned. Uh, we think by providing preschoolers with a later pickup time, so they're not waiting at bus stops at 7, 10 in the morning, and a shorter bus ride because we can provide four or five buses for the JPT run rather than three, which we are currently limited with. And we currently have early release conflicts of JTP with GM and MEH when all three schools let out early. So we think that the benefits here allow your system to operate more effectively and efficiently using its bus routing and that st starting times would better benefit those students. Lisa, please, would you like to address some of this? Yeah, the, the, the area that probably sticks out most for me is that aligning their schedule so that they, so that MEH students and GM students can have access to some of the same courses. Um, our students tend to, in our middle school, um, take higher level courses. And a lot of times we're trying to figure out what time of day they can go um, to the high school to receive those, that instruction. If our schedules are, I think it will be aligned every period except for one, which would mean we can have a lot more um, coordination between the two buildings. So that's probably one of the greater reasons that I see for doing that for our instructional impact for our students. Liz, Erin, Paul, please weigh in. Well, I, th I think the later start time for preschool is really a good choice because it's way too early and I have to crack up sometimes when we're preparing for summer school and elementary starts at 8 and people are saying, oh, isn't that too early? And I'm like, we're getting kids dropped off at 7.50. Um, so I think for children and for families, the later start time makes a lot of sense. I also really think that having more buses and shortening those bus rides makes a lot more sense. Um, I think it helps us have better on time drop-offs, less misses with parents at bus stops. It just helps increase the efficiency across the board. Um, it will impact our staff hours. And so it's really, um, it would be very helpful if a decision was made soon because it's impacting contract hours for staff. And we haven't been able to let them know what their contract hours will be for next year, nor have we been able to advertise the time for the new incoming families. And just as an aside, we have about 20 to 25 students on the wait list, just in case you're interested thinking about Daniel. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think some of the things we'll work through, but we certainly can work through, are going to be logistical with regard to the lunches and the break times for staff with the, with the later hours, but those are all doable, and I think the change makes a lot of sense for students um, and, and for families. Erin, any comment? No, um, our times are unfortunately set pretty tight with our 2232 agreement with Fairfax County. So that's why our times are staying the same. Um, we did have a bit of a discussion about whether Mount Daniel and TJ should remain the same, and we felt like it made sense to keep them the same, but that was why our two times stayed consistent because we're not allowed to start any earlier than 8.50 or end any later than four. So not too much flexibility in there. <laughs> Well, yeah, and, and this discussion, I think, first of all, kudos to Nancy Hendrickson, who put a lot of time and thought into this. This discussion really happens outside the atmosphere of TJ. Our hours remain the same, so we are not impacted this. Um, Aaron is absolutely right. We did look at one point at whether it would be advantageous to change this, ultimately, ultimately concluded that it wouldn't. So this, this works perfectly well for grades two through five. 
the only other thing I'd add that I think it might offer more flexibility for that's not specifically listed on here, but some of the requirements for busing that we have for some of our students, the more we have vehicles available, the less we need additional vehicles to get some of our students, um, students who need a lift bus, students who need to use a driver from a bus for other purposes. So it opens up some, I think, more uh, flexible opportunities for us to meet any new needs that we have with regard to support, supporting and transporting students with disabilities. And the other thing that I wanted to add, it had been a concern for, I know, some of our families for the GM and MEH students to be on the bus at the same time. Um, I just was double checking and they are current, they're running together in the afternoons currently and there has not been um, any discipline issues or problems as far as running the buses to running well. the, both buildings together in the afternoon. So, And it will also eliminate, as Dr. Schiller said, the traffic in the morning. I decide not to go over at the beginning of the day just because it's so hard to get in and out um, and it's, it's a little dangerous. Thank you all very much. Any questions for Dr. Schiller or any of our other? Brian here. So thank you very much. Um, the, the, I guess the three questions I've got, one um, is how you just answered. Um, I'm, I know there's a desire to move quickly, but I think this is an area, at least my, my gut tells me that parents would want some notice and a chance to think about it and comment before the school board moved out. I don't know if we're considering action tonight on this. The second point was I'm a little worried that if we're using all of our buses on the morning runs that we have a sort of lack of resiliency um, in the sense that, you know, if one bus breaks down, you know, if, we, if we're using nine buses and then six buses, you know, there can be a little bit more swapping, but we've got, you know, it feels to me like there's a greater risk because we don't have a bus that could substitute. Um, and then I wanted to know, if, you know, what, what, what the plans would be if there was a mechanical issue with one of the buses during one of the points in time when 15 buses were in use. The last question is, um, we, you talked a little bit, or the point was raised about the traffic. I'm not, could you explain, could someone explain a little bit more about why the traffic is less? Because if we have 15 buses arriving all at once and all of the parents dropping off at once, that feels to me like a worse traffic situation than a better. So I'd like to understand that. Well, we would hope that because of to eliminating the 30 minute wait time for students that maybe less parents would actually drop off um, their students in the morning. Okay. But you would have 15 buses coming and going at the same time. That, that is correct. And right now I believe they're coming in at different entrances. So we will continue that pattern as far as where parents are dropping off and the buses going in in a different, coming in in a different way. So the traffic pattern would have to be reviewed again for next school year. We provided for you a vehicle inventory as requested as part of the information here. And I think you will see that you know, there are substitute buses that are available um, if, as you look through. Um, and as I'm looking through here, and it's just the fact that given their mileage and age and so forth, that um, we do have several in reserve. Any other, uh, Mr. Castillo? Just one last question, and I know you're, you all are not transportation directors, but um, has there been any thought to having a, a staggered late bus schedule? I, I know sometimes 4.30 for MEH and uh, George Mason is, is helpful, but sometimes things go on even a little longer after that. Has there been any thought of having a kind of one, one last call bus at, you know, five-ish or not really? I, I don't believe that's been a request from our administrators that there is a need to have those later buses, but definitely something we can, we can revisit and have a conversation with transportation and our administrators for the need for that. I mean, there's, we would just be paying additional time for drivers to ride, drive a later bus. Okay, well, thank you. Any other questions? All right. Not, uh, thank you all very much. Uh, you all can go home. Wish I was heading out the door with you all. <laughs> Here a little while longer. Thank you all. Okay. Um, 
And Thank you. now we'll move uh, into closed. Mr. Chair, pursuant to the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, I move that the board convene a closed meeting for the following purpose to discuss or consider the identified subject matter. Personnel under section 2.2-3711A1, in particular, staff appointments, staff reappointments, staff reassignments, staff resignations, staff retirement, staff performance, staff change in position, child care leave, medical leave, EPED assignments, and advisory committee appointments and resignations, and legal matters under section 2.2-3711A7, in particular, consultation with legal counsel employed or retained by the public body regarding specific legal matters requiring the provision of legal advice by such counsel. Do you have a second? Second. Okay, uh, Ms. Goodell? Mr. Ankuma? Aye. Mr. Castillo? Ms. Gill? Aye. Mr. Lawrence? Mr. Reitner? Yes. Ms. Watt Ward? Yes. And Mr. Webb? Yes. Right. And before we go into close. A of personal privilege, Mr. Um, Webb? I uh, just want to uh, congratulate you as you uh, are heading off for getting married here, I believe. Congratulations. Uh, hopefully everything, hope you have a great time and... Make sure you come um, back from St. Lucia. <laughs> All right. All right, so we're all going to close right here in the back, so if one who will be there, thank you. I'll entertain a motion to reconvene open. So moved. Second. Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Want to certify the meeting, please? <clears throat> Whereas the Falls Church City Public School Board has convened a closed meeting on the state pursuant to an affirmative request vote in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act. And whereas Section 2.23711B of the Code of Virginia requires a certification by the school board that such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law, now therefore be it resolved that the Falls Church City Public School Board hereby certifies that to the best of each member's knowledge. Only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirement by Virginia law were discussed in the closed meeting to which the certification applies, and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening There's second second all right Ms. Goodell Mr. and Mr. Webb yes mm -hmm. thank you all right, move on to the uh, yeah. We're moving up the consent agenda. Um, and for, for unanimous consent of the consent agenda, all in favor? Aye. We're going to move on to 6.2, the special education annual. Business in action, um, adoption of the 2017-2018 school operating budget. I have before you tonight a series of motions for you to consider that would adopt the operating fund budget. It will adopt the f school food services budget. It would adopt the community services fund budget and adopt the salary schedules for the upcoming school years for all employees as well as approving the benefits of group hospitalization, group life insurance for all eligible employees. I would so recommend your consideration of uh, these budget motions. Thank you very much. Um, before we um, begin the process of adopting the, the motions, um, I'd like to first publicly thank all the members of the school board, the staff, as we work through this budget process, it was a 
a new process for us this year. It was a one that I felt that worked very well. It was bottom up that we, I think mm -hmm. every, every aspect of the district played a role within helping to create this budget. Uh, one that we own as well as I think the, the members of the, of the school community. Uh, the, the public, I think, appreciated a more transparent process this year. And I think we all did a, a very good job of working again to, to strengthen the, the relationships with the city council as we move forward with their uh, proposed recommendation and the ability to, to work with them and compromise to, to make sure that class sizes uh, were not affected in a negative way uh, this year in the budget. And I think we accomplished that. Uh, yes, there is a lot still left on the table that we will uh, continue to work towards and strive towards to make sure that our, our district continues to be uh, one of the top in the country. Uh, but I think we started at a good point and we have a lot of work still before us with the GM um, MEH project. Um, and I think we are at a good place working with our, our colleagues over at City Hall currently um, as we move forward. Uh, but with that, I will entertain a motion for the first 7.01 or Mr. Chair, before, before any motions, could, yeah. I, could I ask a question? Of you most certainly Dr. can, Mr. Schiller. Casillo. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Schiller, I, I believe the city council appropriation was approximately $135,000 less than what our budget sought. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And, and as we all know, the city, the, gen, the excuse me, the city council chooses an appropriation but does not choose how that money is, is spent. So my question to you is what did you cut by $135,000 and in terms of the priorities, uh, what, what, was, what, what were your thoughts? Mm. What we p did with the money that was appropriated was to load it into uh, the top priorities that we had listed in that order. And that was the kindergarten teacher and a kindergarten paraprofessional at Mount Daniel. The um, point six, a world languages teacher to be shared between um, Henderson and the high school and the ESOL point uh, five. And so that is how the additional money that rose to 3.3%. And so there was not a cutback as, but as we had developed that budget in a priority <laughs> sequence, uh, that's how we addressed that. City Council inquired how that money would be appropriated and used, and they had asked that we use that as we had, as I had explained to it, first priority would be to our pr preservation of and enhancement of our program and class sizes. Thank you for that clarification. Any other questions or comments? We will uh, entertain a motion on the first, the adoption of the 2017-2018 school operating budget. Mr. Chair, I move that the school board adopt the 2017-18 school operating fund budget in the amount of $50,570,700, which requires a city appropriation of $41,040,500. Second. Second. Ms. Goodell. Yes. Right. Hi. Yes. 7.02, uh, adoption of the 2017-2018 school food services budget. I'll entertain a motion. Mr. Chair, I move the school board adopt the 2017-2018 school, school food services budget with receipts and disbursements in the amount of $1,108,600. Second. Second. Ms. Goodell. Uh, Mr. Ankuma. Yes. Mr. Castillo. Ms. Gill. Aye. Mr. Lawrence. Yes. Mr. Reitinger. Yes. Ms. Ward. And Mr. Webb. Yes. Next would be the adoption of the 2017-2018 Community Services Budget. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move that the school board adopt the 2017-18 Community Services Fund Budget in the amount of $2,410,900, which requires a total city appropriation of $107,500. Second. Second. Uh, 
Mr. Ankuma? Yes. Mr. Castillo? Aye. Ms. Gill? Aye. Mr. Lawrence? Yes. Mr. Reitinger? Yes. Ms. Ward? And Mr. Webb? Yes. Okay. Uh, next will be the adoption of the 2017-2018 salary schedules. Motion, please. Mr. Chair, I move that the school board adopts salary schedules for the 2017-2018 school year as follows. Teacher salary schedules, support salary schedules, extra pay for extra duty schedules, and miscellaneous hourly and daily rates. Mr. Kuma, is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Gill. Mr. Ankuma? Aye. Ms. Castillo? Aye. Uh, Ms. Gill? Aye. Mr. Lawrence? Yes. Mr. Reitinger? Yes. Ms. Ward? Yes. And Mr. Webb? Yes. And finally, the adoption of the 2017-2018 group hop hospitalization and group life insurance benefits. Mr. Chair, I move that the school board approve the benefits of group hospitalization and, the, and group life insurance for full-time eligible employees, part-time eligible employees, and retirees for the 2017-2018 school year as shown below. Thank you, Mr. Nkuma. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Castillo. Uh, Mr. Ankuma? Aye. Mr. Castillo? Aye. Ms. Gill? Aye. Mr. Lawrence? Yes. Mr. Reitinger? Yes. Ms. Ward? Yes. And Mr. Webb? Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, and next would be the addendum to the superintendent's contract. And I don't know if you have any. If there are any questions from the board, I'd be happy to address them. The purpose of the addendum is to cover the time period from May 15th until June 30th of this year. Are there any questions for Ms. Minson? All right, if not, I'll entertain a motion. Chair, I move that the school board authorize the chair to sign the agreed upon addendum to the contract for Dr. Peter Noonan, superintendent. Second. Thank you, Mr. Ankuma. Uh, Mr. Ankuma? Yes. Mr. Castillo? Aye. Ms. Gill? Aye. Mr. Lawrence? Yes. Mr. Reitinger? Yes. Ms. Ward? Yes. And Mr. Webb? Yes. Thank you. We move on to first reading of policies. Ms. Right. Uh, we have before the board five policies um, that are being reviewed to try to come in conformance with the Virginia School Board Association's model rules. Um, they're all available on board docs and um, happy to share with you the changes between the former policy and the previous policy if there are questions. The first policy is on staff health. It's filed GBE. It's proposed that that is replacing former FCCPS policy 8.5. This is, um, our previous policy was called tuberculosis testing. The new policy comes in line with the new additions of the Virginia Code that were not included in the previous policy. I've also in red under the added language, um, added a section where, in the, where if in the opinion of a superintendent there's evidence that an employee is no longer able to perform satisfactorily their duties, um, the superintendent may, consistent with the ADA and FMLA, require the employee to provide a fitness of duty certificate that the school board would then pay for that um, physician, um, an appointment with the physician. Are there any questions about the proposed staff health policy GBE? Hearing none, moving on to next policy GBN, that's staff hiring procedures. It would replace former FCCPS policy 8.4. It's similar in many ways to the staff and recruitment hiring um, that was part of the previous policy. Um, any questions about this, this policy? Questions, yes, Mr. Lawrence. Just a couple quick ones. Um, and seriously, if you put in line numbers, it'll be so much easier next time. Oh, I was supposed to do that this time. I'm very sorry. No, 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 that's okay. In the second paragraph, um, the red sentence where it says an interview is required. Yes. What is considered an interview? Because if we're telling people you have to do it, if somebody says, oh, I talked to him, I ran into him, you know, over the weekend, and I talked to him, and he's really great, and he sends you an email. I mean, what, what is an interview if we're crying? We do have internal policies that Lisa has shared with all individuals who are part of the hiring process of questions they need to ask, references that they need to check. It's in red because it was not part of the VSBA policy, but we strongly recommend that some type of interview that would include documentation of the questions that were, were asked and then follow-up reference checks would be included. But okay. the, the policy no, I, itself I totally doesn't. agree. There should be... An interview should be required. I was just making sure that we internally knew what we considered to be an interview so that somebody didn't get hired. And then when you looked at the practices, somebody said, well, that's not really an interview. And then you say, 
I didn't know what you needed. We so, do have expectations of staff who are involved in hiring of what they need to include in, in the interview as far as questions and other things. And my only other question is down um, in the line. Line 38 or whatever line it is, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no. Vacancies and new positions within the division are advertised. Does, should that be shall be? That's just really a question. I think it could be. Um, let me go back and look at the code to see if that's language that's taken directly from 22.170 or 22.178. Um, I don't think that it would change um, the, the language itself, but, but I'll get back to you on that. Thank you. That's it. You can. Next one. Um, this is a joint policy, JHG and GAE, the Child Abuse and Neglect Reporting. It would replace FCCPS policy 8.29. Um, one thing that I did not include in, in red font showing that we're adding it from the VSBA policy is the, the paragraph that begins on and after July 1st, 2004. That's something that still is required by the VDOE that we're still doing, so we wanted to port that language over from our previous policy. In many ways, this report, I'm um, sorry, this, this policy follows almost line for line what our previous policy had been on child abuse and neglect reporting, something that I know the division has been focused on and that we're making sure there's training on. So there, there's very few changes, if only grammatical, between our previous um, policy and this one. Questions? Uh, uh, just in the first paragraph where it talks about, you know, in his or her professional or official capacity, what, what about if you learn this just because, you know, you're out, it's on the weekend, you're in your personal capacity, and you learn about something like this, you're still obligated to report, aren't you? You're not a mandatory reporter except for what you learn about in, as a teacher. So just as a nurse, what they learn about while they're in the office of, of a child who has bruises on them, they'd have to report that. If they saw a child in the community on a playground with bruises on them, they're welcome to report. They would be under the law protected as long as they make that report in good faith, but they could not be held um, criminally liable for failure to report. So same goes here. While a teacher outside of their professional capacity might see a student and suspect child abuse or neglect, um, if, they're, if they um, don't report it in the teaching capacity, they, there's a misdemeanor and they could be held liable. Whereas if it's outside the teaching capacity, they have no duty to report that, but they could report it and be protected under the, under the Virginia Code. Does that answer your question? It, it does. It's, to me, sort of an odd answer. Um, Okay, let me, let me think about it. But yeah, you, you answered it. It, it. it basically says what I thought it said, and it just seems like it shouldn't say that. Because we'd always want to protect students. And well, that's children. just it. Absolutely. I'm, I'm trying to figure out when that would ever actually work. Right. So, um, okay, thank you. One other piece that goes with this, we had had a regulation um, Regulation 8.29 that summarized the Virginia law on reporting requirements. It's my recommendation that that regulation um, be removed. It doesn't add anything to the policy, and it's what the law requires. So um, it's it's an unnecessary regulation. Um, okay, regulation. I, I guess the the second bullet under notice of reporting requirement, where it says you know what you just said, all persons required to report cases you know are immune from civil. Would there be any reason not to say? Even if you're not required, this is a reminder that if you report, even if you're not required in your professional capacity, you are still immune. I mean, would there be any harm to not stating the obvious, but. My concern in doing that here is this language is taken verbatim from the Virginia Code as far as what is required of teachers, but as far as training and guidance that's put in place. Um, we have flyers or we have large posters in all of the school buildings and in central office that does remind staff that if they have any doubt, they call and it's up to CPS to decide whether they want to open a case or not. So the, the training that we've been providing to staff, the guidance that we've been providing and that I know counselors have been providing over the course of the year is err on the side of reporting and let CPS decide whether or not they want to take on the case or open up a matter or do an investigation. Okay, as long as we're making it clear to people that you're not restricted to your professional or official capacity and you still can and we hope would report and you still have all the immunity and everything, as long as we're doing that very clearly and very bluntly, then I'm, I'm fine with this. Thank you. Any other questions on policy GH, JHG, GAE? 
Mr. Castillo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just had a question. So it, it seems there are three possible reporting avenues under this regulation. And, and it seems to me that two of them would lead to somebody else other than the building principal or other people within the building not being informed of it. So if you call social services or the toll-free child abuse or neglect hotline, nobody else in the building is, is necessarily going to know about this. And is that a problem? That's a good question. I think it depends on the circumstance of, of who, the, who files the report, who the report is made against. In our experience, when CPS is called, it's often an administrator who's in the room at the same time the call is made, so the principal or assistant principal would know about it. A school counselor would be informed as necessary if there's a, if a special education student involved. The case manager is often, often involved. So um, as far as internal reporting and how it's handled by staff, the, the impetus in the Virginia law is that if someone thinks that there's something that could be abuse or neglect of a child, they report it. Um, but often, either before the CPS call is made or the minute they get off the phone, a call is then made to central office to let Dr. Schiller know, to let me know, to let um, Ms. High know, and then we follow up and make sure that the staff feels supported, that they put support in place for the students. So um, we do have to make sure that we comply with confidentiality provisions, that FERPA isn't violated, that um, that we, we keep accurate notes of who we call and when we call them, but that's kind of an internal process that, that at least we have been handling recently. Um, and that certainly is not reflected in the policy, but is our steps that are being taken to make sure that students get the support that they need, whether or not CPS decides to open up a case. So I guess maybe if it's not here, is, is there somewhere where it says if there's suspected abuse that you will tell central office? Um, or, and if there's not, should we have it? In the training that the social workers currently do at each um, of our buildings, that is included in their PowerPoint to go to your school-based administration, and we've said to administrators that they need to notify the central office. Um, that's what usually the call is made together, and that's what's in, currently in the PowerPoint training that's being shared. So that is a, a procedure that we are using. But it's not in policy? It's not in policy right now. And, and it could be something that we added to regulation that a superintendent says this is the expectation of staff. I, I would respectfully suggest that, that be added. To policy or regulation or? Policy. Mr. Reininger. A couple of quick comments um, in response to um, both of the, the last two. One, <clears throat> the one thing we do need to keep in mind, and this doesn't go against by any means if we want to include the notion of uh, notifying the central office when an administrator is aware of a problem with a student. That strikes me as be something we might want to include in policy, but I would just say we should make sure before we modify the language of any of these policies that we actually want to depart from what the standard policy is um, in the sense that the whole reason we're going through this activity is to avoid having our own policies and to to the greatest extent possible, adhere to the VSBA policy so we lessen the burden for future boards and general counsels and keeping them up to date. Now, this is a fairly minor change and it's something I think that we could keep up if we want to make sure that happens. The other thing I'd say on this specific set of requirements is I think the way, besides the statute itself, the reason it's written this way is that <clears throat> the Suspicion of abuse, while it may be learned of in an official capacity, may not have occurred on school grounds. And so, you know, if, for example, a teacher learned that there might be a parental situation that was resulting in abuse, the, the social services department would probably be the most appropriate place to identify that as opposed to going to a building principal. One, one thing is to your point about keeping the policies with the VSBA model policy. There are two options that we could do. We could have a separate regulation that, that talks about what the expectations are internally for reporting, or we are going to have separate policies that are FCCPS specific policies. So if you want that policy to be a, a staff policy or a policy that's separate and apart from this, times that that either administrators or school staff are expected to reach out to central office to share certain acts that have been taken, for example, anytime 911 is called. That could be a separate policy that we make and we include here, and it's a FCCPS specific policy. So as the VSBA 
changes their policies in line with the Virginia Code, we still have a policy in place. I'd be happy to, to draft something along those lines as well. I, I, I agree with Mr. Reidinger that, that we shouldn't tamper with these model provisions uh, uh, unless there's a real need to. And, but but I, I would say that VSBA is, um, is good, but they're not the alpha and the omega here. I, 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 it just seems to me that um, given Given the seriousness of even the possibility of abuse, it, it's not a bad idea simply to apprise people within the division, um, in addition to somebody else, just so it's known. And, and you know, I think there could be additional resources within the school that be, could be given to the to the affected children. So that's that's the only thing that I'm thinking of here. So, and I think if looking at it from creating something that small, church, schools, because. I think that'll be okay with keeping the the code with that that VSBA does. I think it's it's kind of the way to go still. Okay. Right. Anything else? Questions? Move on. Uh, the next policy is file KN sex offender registry notification. It's former FCCPS policy 5.16. Um, this, this very closely aligns with what the previous um, Falls Church policy had been. The language that's in red is what we have added on to port over from the FCCPS policy. One is um, at the bottom of the page, and you're right, Mr. Lawrence, if I had line numbers, this would be a lot easier, but in red where it says the superintendent will work closely with local law enforcement. I know that that's unique to us given that we're a small division and we do work so closely with the city. We also added on page two, paragraph one, and on page four, paragraphs nine and 10, since those are specific to our division as far as where voting takes place, that the cable TV station is located on the um, George Mason campus. Um, oh, and paragraph 11, that, that students who are registered sex offenders may not be precluded from attending school solely on the basis of their registration. One thing that is different, we as part of our policy 5.16 had included a separate section about the presence of violent sex, sex offenders on campus. The way the VSBA model policies have put that together, that's a separate policy. So KNA is virtually word for word our previous policy language, but now it's broken out into a separate policy. Are there any questions about questions. KN or KNA? And last one, this is not a policy, no, but there's- no. Sorry, uh, sorry. Yes. Mr. Lawrence. No. Go ahead, Justin, start. Um, okay. Thank you, Mr. Webb. Um, first thing in the general security measures, paragraph one, uh, a couple of years ago, we had had a conversation about whether the grounds are sufficiently well marked, you know, no trespassing or nobody on the school grounds without authorization. And, and I think our general agreement was that was a good idea and should be done. I'm not sure it, it has been, but I, I think it might be worth adding that the grounds should be marked so as to put people on notice. Um, and then my other question is, I'm a little confused about the last paragraph of page one about the superintendent working closely with local law enforcement because it seems to create some confusion because it first of all says notifying the community is law enforcement's job, but then the superintendent will work closely with local law enforcement. Um, so how does that work? What if the superintendent gets stiff armed or doesn't even really have sufficient information from local law enforcement? It's my understanding that this was included in the policy because often it's a superintendent or the schools who are bringing to the attention of the police the presence of sex offenders on property um, in working with the SROs, so the school resource officers who are at our schools who would have noticed that somebody has tried to come onto the property or is registered to be a volunteer to school. So the superintendent would then reach out to the police chief and have a conversation about how notification is going to take place. So it doesn't change the, um, the impetus is on <coughs> the, the police to disseminate information in the community, but the police often do come to us and say, this is what we're gonna do, or this is why we're doing it. So um, that language was added over from our previous policy of, of just documenting that we continue, we plan to continue to work closely with local police. Didn't answer your question? I, 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 I'm still not sure I understand what the words mean, um, frankly. I, I mean, I could see the, su the superintendent will, will provide all relevant information to law enforcement, but if it really is law enforcement's job, I, I think you're just mudd muddying the waters there, and I, I would hate for there to be a finger pointing exercise where law enforcement says, well, we thought the superintendent was gonna do that. So, I mean, 
whoever, whoever has the lead role should have the lead role, and whoever helps the people who have the lead role should help the lead role. But the, the, it's just confusing to me, frankly. And if I'm the only one, then, then that's fine. Would you um, feel more comfortable if instead of saying um, the superintendent works with them to determine how and when law enforcement officials notify the community and just the superintendent will um, provide relevant information to law enforcement and... Um... I, I think that makes more sense because, because then it's in the hands of law enforcement uh, and, and I'm confident that they will take the appropriate steps once they get the information from the superintendent. That's a fair point. I can make that change and I'll make sure that I reflect that in the, the second round of the policies when I bring it back to folks. Mr. Lawrence. Um, all right, under anno annual notification. Yes. Where you talk about uh, you're going to notify the availability of information in the sex offender and crimes against minors registry and the location of the internet website. That is the registry, right? It's um, a public website anybody can get to. This is KN, first page. Yes. Okay, that is the registry, right? Yeah, it's the sexoffender.vsp.virginia.gov. The, the right, but that's what we, were, when we talk about the registry later on, that's always what we're referring to, right? Yes. Okay. Then if you go to the paragraph under the bullets on the same page, when the information is disseminated, it shall include a notice that should not be shared with others, even though we're emailing it out to approximately 5,000 parents um, and may only be used for the purposes discussed below. It's a public website. People can use it for whatever they want. And employees who share registry information with others may be disciplined even though employees are sharing it with others. So I'm confused about that, and it goes into the next paragraph that Justin was talking about, too. I believe how this works is the annual notification is this, the school division has to say, here is the website where you parents, members of the community, can go and actively look into whatever it is you want to look into. Makes the other, sense. as far as people who are active registered sex offenders, their pictures are disseminated and school bus drivers, employees who are at the front desk, principals, security staff and coaches are told specifically, here are the photos of people who are in our community who are sex offenders who you need to look out for to see if you see them on our campus. So one is saying you can actively come in and look at this if you want, but we're not sending you the names of people on their pictures that are available on the website. The other is we actively go to these individuals who would be the first point of contact who would see them uh, see folks who are registered sex offenders coming onto campus so that they could be aware of their presence. That makes complete sense. I don't think this makes it clear. Because on the one hand, it says we're going to send this information out to everybody. But on the other hand, we're saying people can't share it. And any employee who shares registry information with others may be disciplined. So I think getting more specific in terms of what you just said, that makes sense. But on the one hand, you're saying you're just using the word registry all the time. And we're saying we're going to share that information, the registry information, with thousands of people. But then other employees can't share registry information. It seems contradictory. I understand what you mean. Mm -hmm. Because what you're doing is sifting it and basically saying, I'm not taking the entire registry. Mm -hmm. I'm taking the people who are within you know, a certain radius or whatever and giving that to you in a different form, that's what you can't share. Mm -hmm. I see. The way it's written now, that's not what it says. Um, I, read, yeah, I read this as being under the subsection, so I think that it inherently applies, it applies within the subsection as you're discussing the sharing of the registry information with these individuals enumerated above mm -hmm. the sentence when registry information is disseminated. I mean, if you want to make it more clear to Mr. Lawrence's point, you could say when registry information is disseminated to the persons enumerated above. So that it's clear that we're, this is a different section of the regulation that we're talking about. So we're not talking about, we talked about annual notification as a separate thing. And this is a, this is a new dissemination of registry information to a certain group of people for a certain purpose. As opposed to just a general notification saying, yeah, I mean, I if you want this information, you can go get it. Distinct, yes, but I, I, that's why I don't think it's an issue because I read it as two distinct sections. 
Well, but I, I think. But it, so you could make it more clear if you wanted to. So after disseminated, you could say to the persons enumerated above. Let me give this some thought because we're under this section or something. We do want to be clear what it is that we're doing, and I don't want anyone to come back and say, "Well, what are we providing, and, and how are people held liable?" So let me um, look into that, and let me look into what the Virginia Code requires, and I can talk to the VSBA to see um, why they've included this language, and if there's other language that we can um, add to clarify. Okay. Um, on. Mr. Reiniger. Oh, sure. Thank you, Mr. Lawrence. Thank you. Um, the, um, I just wanted to say, I, it was perhaps a little bit more clear to me. I, 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 I interpreted this the same way um, Ms. Gill did, that the registry information refers back to not the annual notification, but the very first words in the dissemination part that says sex offender registry information, which I took to mean as information contained within the sex offender registry and not information about the mm -hmm. sex offender registry. But I, <clears throat> I don't have an objection to a, a clarifying word or a parenthetical somewhere in here that could be quickly inserted just to make sure that it's clear. But I, 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 I took, as Ms. Gill said, this to be about the subparagraph as opposed to information about the registry. And I, I think I've said it before, and I'll say it again as a non-lawyer. I, I want these understandable to l humans, yes. not just lawyers. And I hate that sometimes I have to say this is the language in the Code of Virginia. We need to talk to our legislators about it. I'll see if that's the case here. But I agree. If we can make this more clear so that parents and community members can read this and know what the requirements are, we absolutely would love to do that. Um, on page 2, paragraph 2, first line, um, it says, if a notified employee, what does a notified employee mean right there? That term is clearly not defined previously, but I read it to say the individuals who, are, who have been disseminated the sex offender registry information, but we can add a defined term of notified employee. Um, that would help it make more sense. So if we define that term on the first page of those individuals, school bus drivers, employees responsible for registration, et cetera. Um, in the third paragraph, where it talks about, I guess, third sentence, um, principal shall screen each student, teacher, and volunteer's name and address against the registry information. But when we have volunteers, that's not the only screening we do, right? One of the things that we are going to be making a priority this summer is looking into volunteers and what our policies are. Right now, this is the only place and the only policy that talks about volunteers. And there is a Virginia School Board policy um, that talks about volunteers and visitors. So that's one of our big priorities, but it is going to require a united effort for what the different schools do and getting everyone on board. So. Um, short answer to your question that is what is being done now I do know that principals um, try to get in advance the name of the visitor and run that through um, facilities but on occasion a, a visitor has shown up and their information is plugged into the website at, at that exact time and prior to them the visitor being allowed to go down to the classroom or join the field trip uh, it's confirmed that their name um, does not match the registry that's what it is right now and we're gonna make it better yes okay. Um, That's right, Ms. High reminded me we're piloting new machines. I was just going to ask that question. If I remember, you all were looking to get the machines where they scan the, your IDs and your, it runs through, it at, I think, immediately, instantly there. It does. The um, it's being piloted. Um, Mr. Padilla put it in, I think, about two weeks ago at um, some of the schools. And I went in and just tried it, and it asks you, it takes your picture, it asks for your um, license. If you do not have your license, you can say, I do not have my, your license, and then it asks a lot of questions um, that it gains information and still runs you through. Um, when I spoke with the Securita Securitas um, gentleman at the desk, he said he felt that it was really um, providing a, a more, uh, a stronger background check, quicker. So we are piloting that right now at our buildings. And I, I will say for me uh, that I'm in and out of high schools all over the country, m most school systems, that is what they use um, for visitors coming into the school. And I think it is a really good um, process to use for 
for additional layer of security. It has, you know, therefore you have a timestamp of when people are coming in and when they're leaving. And just on the on the security piece, um, I, I think we should modify or at least think about modifying. I said it's sex offender registry information should be provided to employees, which should probably be contractors as well, since Securitas they are not employees. On the first so. page, right? So you might want to read that for contractors as well as. Um, employees and, and there may be other things as well that flow from that. I, I don't know. I just issue spot. Yeah, it says employees and says security staff, but it, it's not clear that that could include security yeah, I, I don't staff think who are we, not employees. Yeah, I don't think we had contracted security staff when this was written last time, uh, or I don't know if VSBA thought about it. But anyway. Right. Okay. That's that's not covered under four contractors. Uh, for contractors, talks about contractors make sure they've, they've been screening. I believe what Mr. Castillo was talking about is under, I wish I put the page line numbers, but on the first page under dissemination of sex offender registration information, it says this information is implied, applied, provided to employees. The point is there are security contractors who um, would also need to get that information as security staff, but they're technically not employees. I, I just, I, I agree with Mr. Castillo on this. It's because this is required and we want it to happen, since our security staff is contractors, I would definitely add employees or contractors to the first paragraph after disseminator or dissemination of sex offender registry information with the concern that otherwise it wouldn't take place. That's a very good point. I will add that. Anything else on KN or the related KNA policy? Mr. Lawrence. Yeah, sorry. You're fine. Um, on page three. Um, section five yes. it talks about you know if, if a match is confirmed um, superintendent confirms that he notifies the board the board can take will take appropriate action to comply what I mean is it just a given that the superintendent would take action they make that match and then notify us I mean it, the way this looks is the, the superintendent finds out that there is a match and then he notifies the board and then you wait for the board to take action but that's not how it works right and this actually it's my understanding that the VSBA is going to be modifying this policy shortly and then I'll have to bring it back before you all um, there is a new requirement under the Virginia Administrative Code that superintendents take certain action when there have been charges that have been um, or convictions that have been um, been made against individuals as sex offenders so um, it's the Virginia code that requires the superintendent to take action and then the school board would um, really not have any other option but to confirm that action under the Virginia code if someone is a convicted um, convicted of um, certain crimes okay. um, under section 6 where it talks about you know determine whether a prospective employee is a registered sex offender how do we get information from other states is that is there a national database where you know if somebody is in you know registered in Tennessee and they move up here how do we find it's out? my understanding that we check the Virginia State Police database but when you fingerprint and the fingerprints are sent through the FBI that'll include charges outside of the state as well so the okay. fingerprint screening is, is much more comprehensive, and that's where that information would be available. Okay, perfect. Um, sorry, just a few more. Under seven, the second paragraph where you talk about, um, you know, a parent of an enrolled student is an offender, barred from being present at school or school functions. How does that, you know, so obviously games, they can't be there. What about away games? Do you have any obligation to notify another school to say, hey, one of our students' parents is a registered sex offender. We can't keep them from your school. We don't control it, but do we need to notify them? I don't know if we need to notify other schools. One point I would like to make, it's not just any, any sex offender. It's a violent sex, sex offender, so that's a limited class within the class of sex offenders. If a parent is a sex offender, they still are allowed to be on school property. It's violent sex offenders who don't have that right, or that right has been limited by the Virginia Code and by, by state law. Well, no, this one, this says registered sex offender you're barred from being present at school or school functions. Other than a violent sex offender. Other than. That express your information.
Anyway, you're really good at taking notes and following up, so you don't I'll have to figure it out right now, but it just... And, and it may be that, you know, the away games, we, you know, we can only do so much. I'm just curious as to what obligations we've got. Um, I've got one that I, I can't really at this hour explain coherently, so I'll You're welcome to call me and we can you. talk through it too. You have something on K&A if you're sure. done with the other one. Um, in the first line where it says no adult, here an adult is what? Simply somebody who is over 18? 18, 18 or older, yes. Okay, so the fact that the second bullet says um, they could be a student, that's not contradictory. Uh, there, there technically could be adults who are still students. Um, if they're 19, 20, 21, special education or ESOL students, so. Right, because that can go up to 22, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, that was it. The only other, sorry, back on the KN. Mm -hmm. Under annual notification, where you say annually notify the parent of each student, do we need to put in parent, guardian, I mean, the whole set of universe of who may be you know, responsible for the kids as opposed to just a parent? I don't think so because I believe parents is going to be defined once we adopt all the policies, but I'll look and see. I also oh. know that the Virginia Administrative Code does define um, parents and so does the Virginia Code. So I think that the implied term would be parents, custodian, guardian. I don't think we need to say it every single time, but I can go back and look and see where that's defined, whether it's going to be in our policies once we get to the full version of the VSBA policies or in the Virginia Administrative Code or Virginia Code. Thank you. That's it. Any other questions? Just an itty bitty little. Vincent, I know you don't like nits, so. No, I, I like I, nits. Don't get me. Well, no, Did I not don't capitalize like something? Nits. You want to kill them. You want to get rid of those Wait, little no, nits. No, but I, I want it to be perfect. So anyway, KNA first bullet casting his slash her. Yeah, actually, oh. that I was gonna. That's one of the things uh, I wasn't gonna say, so. but. Yeah, they're in a you couple of You just need to add the her, slash her. They're casting his slash her vote. First end of the And if I had line numbers, it'd be easier for you to point me towards that. You're absolutely right. That was my mistake. That'll be added in next time in red so everyone can see that's on me. Yeah, and if you want to be that way, first yes. bullet in KNA2. Is her, there's a uh, bullet in KNA2. I'm going to follow up with you on that because I see the one, but it looks like there's another one I'm missing. Uh, casting his vote. Is there another one other than that? That was it. That was the one back there. Okay. Great. I will make that change. The only other um, policies that I would propose removing are Policy 8.20, the Fair Labor Standards Act, and Policy 8.21, Workers' Compensation. Both of those. Um, were revised in 2011, and um, all they do is um, mirror what the Virginia and the federal rules are. There's also a regulation 8.20 that relates to Fair Labor Standards Act. Uh, I spoke with Elizabeth Ewing of the VSBA about this. She said the reason they do not include policies that quote the federal law is that federal law applies. Um, Lisa and I, Ms. High and I, did discuss adding a link on the employee HR page to FLSA. Um, fair Labor for Virginia and for Workers' Comp. So if staff members have questions about it, they can be referred to the law, but there's no reason to have a separate policy on these. Although policy GAA that we um, have considered, I think we're considering that next time, I hope, um, is in, in some ways an FLSA policy, and it was drafted to improve the odds of a division following the FLSA. Um, but I do think that at this point in time, we should remove um, those policies. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Benson. I will add line numbers next time. I, I do apologize. Thank you. Uh, on to uh, old business. Excuse me. All right, I'll entertain a motion for. Board approved first reading of policies GBN. Staff, hire, staff hiring procedures, GA, child abuse and neglect report, 
KN sex offender registry notification. KNA violent sex offenders on school. Second. 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 All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Thank you very much. Now on to old business. Uh, a point of request of waiver policy 9.17 and 7.1 for early admissions to Mount Daniel. Yes, this was brought uh, up to, uh, at our last board meeting, and since then I've done a little research into this matter. Just to refresh, we have two parents who have requested early admission for their children to kindergarten, one for school year 2018, 17, 18, and one for the following school year. Um, I, I did a little um, homework here and to look into uh, several things. Number one, as I put in the memo to you, I've spoken with three entities, including one university who has a center, and each of them do provide, all of them provide, <coughs> um, I should say, uh, screening services at uh, very reasonable rates. Uh, they do have numerous requests from parents accordingly, and, um, and so I enter that information for your consideration. We also researched the fact that um, um, about eligibility for state aid, if students were admitted, the answer is yes, that eligible students would be counted towards ADM, and that you would also be in a position that if you chose to move in this direction someday, that you would be able to uh, charge tuition. Um, so, the, so what the board has before it is a specific request to waive its policy uh, for this upcoming school year of a, to allow a child not of school age to reside in the city to attend a kindergarten. Um, and if you choose to waive the policy um, that you currently have, then you have some questions you have to answer uh, with regard to a tuition charge. and. Um, to what extent, uh, who will pay for the appropriate assessment or screening, and uh, to what extent there is availability of classroom space. Uh, it's a larger policy question for you than just this one waiver. As I indicated before, there are school districts around the country due to um, preparation of children going to early childhood education programs at a much earlier age and developing skill sets. Um, to determine whether or not this board wants to enter into this kind of uh, early admission, as well as a look into transitional grades. I will leave that to Dr. Noonan and to this board to decide for the future of where its policy may be. But uh, again, we do have an immediate request from a parent uh, for planning for next year, and that is what is before you. Thank you, Dr. Schiller. Are there any questions? Yes, Mr. Exceed. Point of order. This is this is listed as for discussion only. Or is I was going to say it's from what I'm looking at. It's just discussion. I don't know uh, if it, it's something that needs to, so, to be addressed might, this evening. My 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 recollection of the discussion that we had last week was that um, the board did not want to proceed to grant a waiver in the absence of a policy and a decision to approach this in a particular way, so that. Um, the matter before us now is not for voting on the request for the fall, but I think whether to undertake um, consideration of a policy for early admission given the data that Dr. Schiller has provided. Thank you, Mr. Reininger. Are there additional questions and I assume this will be something that um, or a conversation at a work session to kind of get teed up for the potential of of making a final decision on this in in a timely manner for the family who's looking for an answer for this upcoming uh, school year this fall but I think it be in a work session first to to review documentation that, uh, that Dr. Schiller just. Yeah, I think that would be a good idea because, you know, it's interesting this day and age 
when, when back in the day when dinosaurs roamed the earth, starting young seemed to be something that was very frequent. Now there seems to be much less of that. So I'd be, I, I'd want to be sure that we understand the research and, and, and the performance of children who do start before this time, so. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Just Mr. a couple Morris. things. First, and I know I've asked this before, did we notify the families who have written that we were talking about this tonight? We had not last time. I, I notified one because she's a neighbor. Um, I still don't get the feeling that we told the other one that we were going to discuss it tonight any more than we did last time, which I find odd for us to do that. I'm at fault for not doing that. I wanted to know if we, if we had told, so. I had not contemplated action. I had thought that this was more of an information item that I was trying to do research on and afternoon and frankly it just slipped my mind um. no 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 that makes that makes complete sense I was just curious I mean the fact that we're gonna go and talk about it at work session is that's yeah, fine I did not see the immediacy of this in light of the fact that starting enrollment registration space and that it's a very large policy issue for your consideration and right. I, I did not want to see dr. Newton's direction of the district Yeah. But I will notify the parents that uh, at a scheduled work session um, in either May or June, uh, the board will d discuss this policy. And, and you mentioned the immediacy of the problem. Is What is the clock on it? We have one who's talking about September 2017. Right. When would we need to... It, it would seem to me our kindergarten registration is coming up this week, tomorrow. tomorrow. <laughs> and um, we were not certain, of course, that we were going to get that additional kindergarten teacher from, right? And so it would seem to me that once you had the kindergarten registration and you have your allocation, then um, you would have an opportunity to determine if you have room. In the summer, to what extent, given what you've experienced in the past of walk-ins, and that's what's tenuous. I think the bigger question is, is this, is this the direction you want to go and what are its implications? How many potential students are there? The notification of any and all parents of this opportunity. The question of who would pay the fee. There are a lot of the policy issues that I think you have to get your arms around, but I think in all honesty, your, your drop dead date is going to have to be once you know of the numbers of students who have registered for kindergarten signed up this summer. There's that many vacancies anticipated. Which I and you mentioned tuition. So you're saying we would be able to charge tuition for residents. That was very clear in the um, state uh, law. We even called down to um, the State Department to get verification of that charge, that it would be, um, yes, uh, somewhere akin to um, another situation we recently looked at, the other end of the age spectrum, and that you would also be eligible for um, students counting towards your early, average daily attendance. Uh, next will be the, are there any topics for future agenda items that anyone potentially has? Sir, Mr. Lawrence. Sorry, I, I, last time I said, um, and hopefully the bell schedule that we did today wasn't the answer to my question because that means I asked it very badly. Um, at some point, could we have a session talking about how aligning the bells between GM and MEH has worked in terms of students at MEH taking advantage of more classes at GM, because that was really the point. Before, 
they could only go and you know take classes at block one and the idea was if you align it then you give all these opportunities and obviously it's not going to go from you know 30 kids at MEH to 140 in a year but I just want to know you know are we moving in the right direction it may be that we'd want to keep the bell schedules the same way even if there wasn't a big increase I'm just curious because that was one of the main reasons for well to me that that was the reason for doing it so I'm just curious, I'd like to hear, you know, how are the kids from MEH benefiting, taking advantage of it, and how do we see that going in the future? Can I report back to you at the next meeting by asking maybe Mr. Harrison, Mr. Hills to be able to provide you that data? Um, oh yeah, no, that's what, meeting. future agenda items, okay. future, yeah. Anyone else? Uh, now, uh, Mr. Castillo. Uh, just something to plan in our collective minds uh, with a superintendent now in hand in the summer coming up um, I would suggest it might be time to start considering when we want to plan a governance type of retreat or action and and whether the board is so inclined um, one of the other ideas that I brought back from NSBA was uh, a board member said that they commenced training of school board candidates well in advance of the election and it might be worth inviting the candidates uh, for the upcoming election to be to participate in our governance training which I think would benefit them uh, and, and us as well so um, it's not really an agenda issue as such but I think the the summer will be here sooner than we realize uh, that is something that uh, Dr. Noonan and I have um, discussed and will discuss a little further and then propose some uh, possible dates for, for the board and see what's available uh, for a day long, day and a half, and, and location for that. But yeah, it is definitely something that's on the radar. All right. Thank you. Uh, on to the superintendent report. Uh, yes, so one matter I'd like to report on. Uh, we had today an hour and a half debriefing with the who conducted the special education study last week. Um, very uh, detailed uh, briefing that uh, brought much to uh, the forefront with regard to not only the methodology and the number of um, responses from parents and teachers to the survey and the over 80 interviews that were conducted, but also hearing the many, many uh, comments of and um, conclusions as well as recommendations. Um, we expect to have the draft report the end of May for staff review, and it'll then be finalized in early June. I, I think that you will find that the depth of this report and, what you, and the findings and the accommodations and the recommendations and a path forward is going to be extremely beneficial for Dr. Noonan and the board for planning for the future of how to address a very fine program that to take it to high, uh, greater heights, as well as to uh, recognize some of the um, areas that need improvement. You may want to consider spending a considerable amount of time in delving into the, this report because it has layers and layers of um, areas, and um, I learned a lot today uh, through the debriefing. I think we all did, uh, particularly about some things that uh, uh, our cost drivers and some of the other and how we compare to peer districts and it may be worthwhile and this was an oversight on my behalf I probably should have included in the scope of work for the consultant to make a presentation uh, to to you but that's something that you may want to consider but it was a very successful I think endeavor Lisa anything you want to add to that no, I really think it's going to be beneficial as we move forward just with the recommendations and commendations to um, let us know what we're doing well, but also help us move, continue to move forward for helping our students to be successful. So, nothing else. I would also um, say this is my last uh, meeting um, as your uh, interim superintendent. I want to thank the board for the last five and a half months uh, for the honor of being able to serve you. Uh, I would like to say it has been a pleasure, but I cannot go that far. <laughs> <laughs> but again, I thank you very much to each and every one of, to each and every one of you for your personal friendship. I mean that, as well as your support and keeping me on my toes. I've enjoyed that. Thank you.
And now on to our board and see lazy on comments. And I'm going to start down at the end with Mr. Lawrence and we'll pretty sure I think everyone may have a little something to say tonight as we go down. So we'll start at the end with Mr. Lawrence. Yeah. Um, first, I'll start with a commercial this Friday. <laughs> Uh, Falls Church Edu Education Foundation Gala. If you haven't bought your tickets already, please buy them. You can also buy them for teachers if you don't feel like getting dressed up and going out. Um, I know Dr. Schiller wouldn't want us to get too maudlin, but uh, in about five months, so, so what I did, I'm just going to go down what I'd see as the things he did because nothing speaks volumes more than simply saying what somebody accomplished in five months. I mean, first he walked in right at the beginning of the budget and he didn't miss a step. He uh, made a hard budget process better, more transparent, more open, and the community admitted it, which is, you know, our community can be tough to, to win over. He built relationships with the city council, he built relationships with the community, and he did so many school tours, frankly, he probably knows the ins and outs of all our schools in five months better than we do, and we've all lived here decades. Uh, on GM, he shepherded through the GM working group. He's got the economic working group moving. He's done field trips to other schools so we could learn from best practices. And he pushed for the, the RFP and for the feasibility study, which we're going to see in a, uh, in a very short time, which is obviously about the biggest single project this city has ever done. Um, we had huge CIP discussions, not just GM and MEH, um, we had lots of changes and he managed to take, remember our, our GM roof repairs that were going to be a separate CIP item because they were seven figures. He got that down to five and it was, you know, flip and the ripples weren't even seen anymore. On Mount Daniel, um, you know, he helped push Mount Daniel to where it is now and helped talk us down from hundreds of thousands of dollars from a, uh, Developer who said, you know, with the delay from Fairfax, it was going to cost us a lot more. The special ed survey he talked about. Um, we've got huge policies. Basically, every single policy is under review. Also, thanks to Tricia for putting up with us. But it was, you know, he got the process in in line, and it's going to take a while. But he he got it moving. And then finally, just advice and counsel on our superintendent search. I mean, I've never met somebody who came into a job and so rapidly pushed to try to get out of the job by saying you need to hire somebody months earlier than you wanted to. I mean, we were looking at July 1 and, you know, his first week, I swear, he said, no, March. Look at March. And he kept doing it. And honestly, I, I think that helped us move a lot faster than we would have otherwise, because I think we all had July 1 in our head. And you know, thank goodness we ended up where we did, when we did, and, you know, in two weeks, less than two weeks, we'll have a, uh, a new superintendent. So that's the list of things that, you know, we can talk about and all the other things that are in, you know, closed session and confidential where he just gave us advice based on decades of experience that, you know, I found completely invaluable. And all I wanted to say is thank you, stay in touch, come back. And, uh, you had a lot accomplished the last few months. <laughs> a little. As a board, I mean, I think back about um, what we have done um, and how far you have moved in so many areas. And I, I just feel very good about the fact that you hired someone who is a perfect fit for this district, who's able to start at a running start here to get to know the very fine people who work he here for the next six to eight weeks and to be able to do his assessment and be able to really carry through over the board's uh, direction. And I do think that was your biggest accomplishment. And as I had said to a couple of, your, of you in, individually over a cup of coffee or, or wherever, is the fact that there are th two or three major decisions coming up that wanted to accomplish and I said you know for you know keep your eye on the ball it's getting your future leader as soon as possible and you did that and I pushed you for that for my own selfish reasons but more importantly seriously because this district deserves that kind of leadership uh, that uh, someone with Mr. Uh, Dr. Noonan's um, posture and experience uh, and style is going to be able to take a very good district to the great level 
I really feel strongly about that. And if there's anything else, is the fact that I've looked upon you all as, as personal friends until we had to do business. And I think, you know, one thing I've learned over time is that if you can, if you can have a personal relationship with people who are going to make some hard decisions, then you can argue, discuss anything, because you know what you're doing is in the best interest of the greater good, and that is the school district. And whether it was late at night that we had telephone calls or a cup of coffee before the sun came up in the morning, Michael, or with Teddy, <laughs> or you and I, I mean, we've grown a lot yeah. together. I mean, and the Thursday morning meetings that we have had in order to go over matters. But the key is, is that I've had incredible support from Hunter and from uh, Lisa and Tricia and Marty, who has put up with me like you wouldn't believe, and every other staff member here and everywhere I've turned, people want, and I say this to you, Dr. Noonan, people in this district want the superintendent to be successful. They show 50% of the support that I've enjoyed to you. You're going to really, truly enjoy every moment here because the people here are good people. This board cares deeply, but I think something you saw tonight, the respect that this board has for its staff is astounding and will listen to the staff. There are two things I take away of remembrance is the night we brought our principals here unvarnished to talk about the budget to you. And tonight, when staff members can sit before a board and share with you their thoughts, they've not been programmed. That is a very healthy environment, but thank you. Let's move on, it's getting late for you all. <laughs> I'll just echo all of that. It's been a pleasure working with you, Bob, it really has. And I, the community loves you, and I know city council members are looking for money to keep you on as a consultant, <laughs> so watch out. Um, uh, for a uh, business matter, um, the Athletic Boosters held a really successful family fun night on Friday night. They invited all the elementary um, families to come up, and it was great. It was really community building and a lot of school spirit, and it was fun for the younger kids to see the older kids playing sports and see where they can go. So hopefully we'll be able to do more of those in the future. Uh, about 10 days ago, I went to a fascinating uh, BSBA Hot Topics conference down in Richmond presented by Phil Gore, who I had heard speak at NSBA in Denver in March, talk about, uh, talking about how school boards can have an impact on their community. And I'll, I'll just read, I, I won't go through the whole presentation now, and I'll send the deck as soon as I get it, but um, he talks about, uh, he, he, he gave ideas about how school boards can uh, generate improved student achievement. And here were his top six, starting with the top one. The top correlation was superintendent goals focused on student achievement. Second is communicating expectations to the community. Third is basing contract decisions on objective evaluations. Fourth, collaborating with staff and community on the district plan. And then for us, basing our work plan on our district goals and checking those goals with each of our meetings and then constantly monitoring progress towards goals in the plan. I think Dr. Noonan has a great blueprint for creating a learning organization um, at all levels in our district. Uh, I think making our board a learning organization is and should be part of that plan. And I think what I learned, and again, I'll, I'll s spread some more of this around as soon as I edit the eight pages into something more manageable. But I, I think we're at an inflection point where I think much of the work that Dr. Schiller has done to, to do a level set on many aspects of our operations has created a good environment for us going forward to really come together as a board and as a district and as a community to start to get to the next level of achievement uh, for everyone in our community. Um, with respect to Dr. Schiller, um, I, I second everything that's been said. I think the only area of deficiency for him has been poor negotiating skills because I think if you look at the dollar value of consulting services that we got from him, we made a great deal. We made a huge deal and you not so much because you left a lot of money on the table. 
And, and, that's, and we, 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 thank you. we thank you for that. Uh, I, I think Dr. Schiller has done wonderful work. Um, I, I, I would say he, we shouldn't consider him an interim superintendent. He is and always will be in mind a, a superintendent co-equal with uh, those who've come before and those who will come after. And uh, I look forward to staying in touch with him and thank him for all he's done for our community. I will uh, third or quad, whatever the appropriate <coughs> number is, everything that's been said before. Um, Dr. Schiller, Bob, you <coughs> when you came here, there were sort of four big things we had to accomplish, four big things. Um, the first was Mount Daniel, check. Um, second was the budget, check. <laughs> the third was hiring a new superintendent, check. <laughs> So the, the fourth, the only one we haven't completed yet is the George Mason MEH project. But really, it's three out of four, so Dr. Noonan can just come in and you know, cruise on the laurels and what you've accomplished so far. Um, I, I will, I'd only say I, I'd go a little bit farther than you did. It, it's been an absolute joy to work with you, and I really appreciate it, both your friendship and what you've done for the district. I guess you've all said, you've, you've said it off. Uh, Bob, I'm just going to say a big thank you, and uh, I'm going to miss our coffees, but I'll find you. Wherever you are, I'm coming for coffee. That's all I'm going to say. Thank you so much. I have learned a lot. I'm a better person, a better board member for meeting you and for learning all that you taught me about the process at, and the governance and all that. Thank you so much. Well, I just, everybody pretty much said it all. Um, it's been such a pleasure working with you, Bob. And really, and like Michael said, I've learned so much under your tutelage. I have learned more in the five months that you've been our interim superintendent than I have in the entire three years I've been on this board. And I really appreciate everything you've done to help build me up into a better board member and a better teacher even. And um, I enjoy our time together, and we're really going to miss you. And we're so grateful for everything that you've done. You've really done miracles. <laughs> and I feel like we've robbed you <laughs> because of everything you've done and, and what we have in, in the way of yeah, compensation. <laughs> but thank you. Uh, I can't say enough. And I'm, and be, I'm beyond tired right now, so of course I'm babbling a little. And I could probably go on and keep us all here for another 30 minutes, but I won't. <laughs> Thank you all. And finally, um, Bob, I want to say uh, you have done just great things from, a, from the time you've been here. It feels like five and a half months. It feels like you've been here for years of all that you were able to accomplish over, over these five and a half months from as a... Phil just said, getting us to the finish line with the Mount Daniel project, uh, essentially revamping our process of how we went about doing our budget <clears throat> to being transparent and folks felt, I think people in the community felt that and were very appreciative of the fact that the, they saw what they have been asked for and they finally got to see that. I think the inclusion of the teachers, I think they felt valued and, and felt very good that they were bought into the process of how the budget was, was created and I think they all feel very good about that. Uh, in this short period of time, you've put some pretty big shoes for Dr. Noonan to, to step into and fill, on it, but I think we have a, a great new leader and I'm happy that you did push us to to go through that process, I think quicker than what we probably would have gone through it. But I think with that being a great counsel for us, of helping us to, as we move through the process. And then for me, uh, taking a coming on and being the chair for, with a interim superintendent, uh, you have been tremendously helpful to me uh, as we have moved through this process. I think uh, having you in this role has been great. It has helped me learn a lot of about the process. It has helped me learn a lot about being in this leadership role. And I think um, that you didn't hold it against me that I didn't vote for you when you came to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as I said, that was um, 
no deal. one of the things that I, you know, look back and seeing the relationship that you and I have built over this five and a half months, it has been a great relationship. And I look forward to keeping in contact with you. The relationships that you've built on uh, with the general government that they all have at some point asked, are you all going to keep Bob around to kind of help with that? And I'm like, we're, we're working on something. But, you know, if you'll have a little money to help us do that, <laughs> we'll be more than happy to take that as well to, to, to do that. Uh, but on behalf of the board, just a small little thank you certificate uh, that says a certificate of appreciation awarded to Dr. Robert Schiller, interim superintendent, in appreciation of your dedicated and dedication and service to the Falls Church City Public Schools and community, given to you on today, May May second, twenty seventeen. Thank you. I appreciate that, sir. Thank you very much. Appreciate. It. No, 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 no. Thank you. Appreciate it. My wife told me to make sure that, because I talk so much about you all, my close staff and to all of you, to make sure that if you're ever in South Florida or on an island in South Carolina, you have to come and visit. I do yeah. hope that um, if you take another trip to uh, Hilton Head. Board retreat? Hmm? Board, board retreat, retreat at your house, South Carolina, <laughs> Florida. But buses, I, buses welcome. <laughs> yeah. But I do hope that uh, we, we can um, see each other socially. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, final thing, well, I'll ask unanimous consent for approval of the minutes for the April 6, 2017 meeting. All in favor? Okay. And finally, just several items for for review um, materials, and then the enrollment. Mm -hmm. And with that, I'll ask for adjournment. Motion to adjourn. All right. We are adjourned. We are. <laughs>